All right, everybody. Good morning. Uh, good day, wherever you guys are calling in from. I know we have some people from the West Coast, East Coast, all up and down um, from the North to the South. I want to welcome you guys to the NAVC 03 Industry Day. Um, thank you all for participating. Wow, you guys are just popping in like popcorn. And that's actually my favorite snack. So um, I am definitely your most unconventional, probably government host you'll ever see. Um, but that's on purpose because I can't uh, I, I can't be as professional as some of the others of my colleagues like you'll see later on today. However, um, I'd like to welcome you guys. And as you take a few moments to sit at the, in the virtual audience with us, I'd like to give you some logistics for today. Um, if you have any questions, can you please direct them to the question and answer function? And um, what I'm gonna do is be reading off those questions to all of the presenters. And um, uh, if, if you have some engaging things in the chat, you wanna comment on some of the things you're saying, we will be tracking the chat too. Um, however, we have a, um, a wonderful, amazing day packed for you guys today. Um, again, I will be saying this in the chat over and over. If you have questions, please put them in the questions and answers. That way, um, in the question and answer function, that way, if you guys um, were unable to get to your question, we'll be able to answer them um, for the whole community, because as, as this is industry day, we want to make sure everybody has all of the information that we give out to everybody. So um, again, if you have any questions, please drop them in the questions and answer. If you have anything that you need to chat us, please write that in the chat. And uh, we welcome you to NAVC 03's industry day. Um, so uh, Admiral, we have um, a, good, a good amount of attendees. So if you'd like to have your opening remarks, you can have the floor. Hey, uh, thank you, Ashley, and uh, a big welcome to everyone to the very first NAFCO3 Industry Day. Uh, we have over 200 companies that signed up for this event, so a big shout out for all of you. Uh, thank you for your participation, and uh, thank you for your interest in support of our national defense. And more than ever, uh, we're going to need your subject matter expert. We need your expertise to advance our capability. Uh, this, is this is the first one, but definitely not the last one. Uh, NAFCO3 is a new directorate responsible for cyber engineering and uh, digital transformation. We have an amazing two days with uh, uh, a lot of focus on our concerns, our opportunities for NAFCO3. I hope everyone will have a chance to listen to our presenters on the various topics. Day one basically will cover all of our portfolio and area where we might need help. Day two, you will have a chance for one-on-one -on -one with some of our uh, leadership here at NAFCO3. So with that, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, hope everyone had a great days. And uh, if I anything I can do for help uh, to help, please let me know. Back to you, Ashley. Thank you so much, Admiral, for those opening remarks. And now I'm gonna pull up the first presentation. Again, um, audience, if you have any questions or anything that you see, please uh, direct them to the Q&A function. We also have all of our panelists on here that's gonna be able to answer any questions that we can. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. No, we did not send out these slides. However, um, you guys will be able to have access to the, the recording after the, after the event. So uh, let me get the first slide and let's see. Sorry. And I'll share that. Okay, team, uh, verify that you can see the slide. You can see the slide, Ashley. All right, let me make it full screen. I always forget how to do this. <laughs> oh, oh, full screen. All right, here we go. After that, you want to go to the, the next slide, please? Go ahead and introduce yourself, Chris. Roger that. So first off, I want to get to our kickoff slide. And then uh, my name is Christopher Fleming. I work in CO3Q under the uh, Float Cybersecurity Engineering Group. Um, one of the key factors that we wanted to kind of get across in today's uh, portion of the industry day brief is 
you know, this start off slide that compliance is not enough. Uh, some folks who've been around have seen this and heard this many times from our team members. And it's just a reminder to kind of kick off uh, this mentality and a reminder to all those participating today that, you know, in simplest terms, that compliance is not enough. Um, even as of yesterday, in the Washington Post, they published an article about 30 nations, NATO, publicly condemning groups for cyber activities. And this is a constant um, flow of information. This is a constant concern that compliance alone won't fix. This is like a leak. Um, it will constantly happen. It's persistent. And the chain metaphor sometimes is overused and folks have kind of gotten used to it over time. Um, so let me propose hull integrity is another item because keeping water out of the people tank is an important thing. Keeping the cracks from under the water line is significant. Um, the water will come in, the cracks are significant and we need to do what we can to make sure that we are providing the best integrity and in products to our warfighters. Um, these nation states like red teams are not interested in compliance. Um, a break in integrity of our systems is unacceptable, regardless of its compliance, um, just like the thresher or the challenger. The reality is some of these actions can have long lasting ramifications. And as colleagues, teammates and partners, um, when it comes to the fight, and again, the fight will occur and history has shown time and time again, it will, we need to be prepared for all five domains of warfare. Next slide. So as you can see on the slide here, this is a quick uh, kind of five group perspective of the Chief Information Security Officer group, which I'm a part of, um, starting with our Chief Information Security Officer, our Cybersecurity Tech Warrant Holders, our Cyber Governance Group, our Enterprise Cyber, and the group I'm in, the Cyber Engineering Directorate. Um, <clears throat> excuse me as I change my own slide. Um, you know, our objectives include um, providing this unity of effort between shipboard and ashore cybersecurity, operational capabilities like situational awareness um, and our ability to respond in an effective amount of time and expanding and innovating our capabilities in cybersecurity. Next slide, please. As you can see in our chart here from the CNO down to CO3Q, our cyber engineering, there's alignment in our mission for how we can increase the capacity readiness capabilities and seasoning wars for our sailors through the five, I mean, the three major uh, priorities from Admiral Galenus himself about delivering combat power, transforming digital capability, building teams to compete and win. And this extends through our CO3 capabilities about innovation, digital architecture, ecosystems, model-based system engineering, and enhancing our workforce. And this flows directly into CO3Q in the far right as we focus on supply chain risk management, how we're helping our sailors and making sure that what they get is what they need. Um, the capability growth, understanding our endpoints, understanding that cyber resilience starts with understanding what you have and the triage of those moments when things go south. Uh, the model-based system tools, so we stop um, the do loop where we're doing a lot of manual processes, but can scale effectively when it comes to our analysis and understanding of the threat and our opportunity to get ahead of it. Um, distribute TNE, how can we be smarter about making sure that when we get things to the fleet that they are as effective as possible? Cybersecurity safety, it's paramount for any operational technology where there's a physical effect that we make sure that the things that we produce and we put out there are both secure and safe uh, to the warfighter. Uh, policies and standards, all reality and everything we do, there's a level of authority in making sure that those lines are well understood. And this is where those policies and standards come into play. And in alignment with our seasoned warriors, cybersecurity education, there's a lot of different activities we do with SANS and other web-based content to make sure that our wor workforce has as much opportunity as possible to grow and to extend that knowledge set into future generations. Next slide, please. So 
So th this is an interesting topic. It's been relatively uh, heightened as we see through different fiscal years, different topics get a little bit more attention than others. And definitely supply chain risk management is uh, getting a lot of press these days. And the reality is we need to assure that the capabilities we provide have a level of assurance that don't undermine the end result. Uh, it just goes back to the metaphor of the crack below the waterline. Um, we need to make sure that the end product is at the appropriate level of integrity at the end state, um, making sure that the software we provide, making sure that the hardware that is integrated and developed gets to where it needs to be. Um, so this is important as partnerships, as I said earlier on the slide, as teammates with industry that we are working well together and identifying these threats, identifying these responses and making sure that we take full ownership of our different pieces of positive, whether it be the government, making sure things and all documents are labeled appropriately and making sure that the safeguarding of those items in industry are appropriately handled. Um, there's new requirements coming down. There's a lot of coming through DFARS and making sure that we can be more on top of the potential that might occur when it comes to supply chain risk management. And you can see some of the, um, the different countermeasures at the bottom here, as I kind of described before, like software assurance, how we're doing static code analysis or dynamic code analysis and those types of tools, how we're making sure that the motherboards and hardware and the other system components we provide are at the appropriate integrity level. So, you know, as anyone who's ever been a part of a ship at Vail knows, getting things on and off a hull can be interesting. So making sure that the things that we do get out there stay there and they work appropriately. Um, and that make sure that our strategies and our anti-counterfeit opportunities and practices are actually where they need to be. Next slide. So this entire slide and the idea of the cyber capabilities is all stemming around the idea of the identify, protect, detect, response, and recovery framework, the NIST critical framework, and really emphasizing on how we can do better. There's some aspects of it like in protection. Um, many things are preventative like walls and fences and gates that they're gonna be out there. They're part of an infrastructure that's gonna be there for a while. Um, then there's the more proactive pieces the automated components of hardening. And those are some distinctions and protection that we need to expand upon in the components for our float cyber. Um, for the first one, as I mentioned earlier, the key part of cyber resilience starts with identifying and understanding what you have. You can't protect what you don't know. And that has a lot to do with enumerating and monitoring um, the capabilities and the systems and assets that you have. Um, detection, how we're doing agile defense, how we're understanding what we have. It's part of that monitoring piece. Um, mission impact awareness. This is an extension past normal seam work and asking ourselves, you know, how are we supporting particular missions and asking ourselves those questions? Because a lot of times um, CVE, X, Y, or Z are certain you know, vulnerabilities can be understood, but the actual overall effect of how it handles the system of system or even the particular component can sometimes be misunderstood. Automated analysis and extensible transport is about taking that digital transformation change and how do we do better with the information we have and making sure that we can quickly and dynamically and agilely respond to the information we receive. And then recovery, and as I talked about earlier, mission triage and resiliency about how we actually respond and recover so that we can get back to an operational level um, of success when we're trying to endure the fight. And so on the left, we talk more about the different components about the NIST critical framework. And on the right, just a reminder of how um, with DeFIA and so many other standards out there, we're trying to work better about control points and understanding our enclaves and embracing those capabilities within those enclaves. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, um, a particular focus in our group is operational technologies or sometimes control systems and specifically for the Navy, Navy control systems and getting to that understanding about identify, detect, 
uh, protect, respond, and recover, and making sure that we understand our endpoints. Um, and in the particular, when it comes to operational technology, respecting the deterministic nature of those networks and systems. So we have to treat them differently because it is important that the integrity and the safeguarding of those networks and those components are done in a way that it doesn't somehow negatively react to the system itself. We don't want to add problems. We don't want to have it. This is publicly known. We don't want to have another solar winds. We want to make sure that we can do better and make sure that we're not injecting uh, pivot points into our systems. So part of doing this in that identify piece is understanding our endpoints, providing those tools and using some of those to help scale and do that digital transformation and build those digital models and then enhance that by adding capabilities on the back end. So we want to take those models, we want to understand those networks, and we want to take them and enhance them to get better ground truth and to expand on our advantage and our understanding of our systems, both now for our legacy systems and in our future new construction platforms. Next slide, please. So in here, back to what I was talking about, the authorities, um, two major plays in authority for our group in particular involves the Cybersecurity Technical Authority Board, um, the Board of Chief Engineers between the major system commands in the Navy, in addition to our own system command and how we're trying to provide additional policies to help set a tone and guidance, just as NIST has provided guidance to the federal government and so forth and so on through our chain of command. Um, the Tech Authority Board and through our own group try to provide that additional nudging or guidance to our colleagues and partners moving forward. This includes, um, you know, better understanding how to standardize an understanding of cyber posture to make sure that our architectures for particularly operational technologies or control systems are well understood, um, making sure that we get better guidance out there about creating uh, or extending capabilities to our operational centers. In addition to that, making improvements in cyber governance, um, supply chain rich management, which we already talked about earlier, and making sure we standardize our incident response. Uh, for our own systems command, um, we're definitely trying to enhance our understanding and our guidance about boundary defense and situational awareness, how we monitor, how we respond, how we do data archiving, and how we do data capture to make sure that the data we collect, the information we provide has merit and that we're using it effectively uh, with our partners. Next slide, please. To help with our seasoned warriors and making sure we're expanding our advantage within our workforce, um, we've created some Navy control system curriculum, just as I spoke about certain operational technologies um, sometimes for some folks are synonymous with IT and the reality is they are different. So making sure we expand that understanding um, and helping NASI Enterprise and our partners understand the differences between control systems and information systems, how the data is handled, how the mission focus is different has come about in this curriculum that we've been developing and promoting to help enhance that knowledge set so that we can better support the mission for those systems and help grow a workforce that can better support and understand that. This also includes a lot of classes as we work out with industry to try to grow and create those class curriculums, whether they're web-based or in-person training. And this allows us to provide a more scalable means to get the training out to the people who need it best. As we have experience with the current pandemic, um, web-based training has kind of exploded and it's given us a lot of opportunity um, to take advantage of that particular mechanism and allow us to really help grow the workforce and enhance that skill set so that when we do have to get on haul and we do have to work with those systems, that the folks doing that work better understand the systems and can help provide um, that expertise to uh, the fleet and the warfighter. Um, and that would conclude the slides. I believe the next one is backup. So I think, Ashley, at this point, uh, we would do QA. Over. Okay, the first question is, who is the chairperson and other members of the CS Authority Board? Uh, NAVWAR is the chair. 
of the CS tab and out in San Diego. And then each chief engineer of a systems command, NAB Air, NAB C, um, MARFOR, uh, not MARFOR Cyber, but um, Marine Corps, um, NAB SUP, and NAB, NAB FAC are all members of the uh, Tech Authority Board. Over. Thank you. Um, the next question is where there will there be more information available on NCS training? In in this forum, I don't have anything, but in our own group, we have uh, particular leads that that are actually said developing that curriculum and they're available. Um, I guess if you reach out to myself, I can get you in contact with uh, with our lead when it comes to NCS training and help facilitate that over. Uh, let me just add uh, our training approach also complements our NCS training with uh, industry-based training, which uh, we rely uh, a lot on uh, SANS training and there's uh, other training aspects. So some of that uh, training information that we leverage is, is already readily available to industry to uh, complement our, uh, our NCS training, over. Any other questions, Ashley? Uh, yep, got two more. Um, how will NAFC implement these architecture standardization and our policies when there are so many of the systems of record or PORs that are managed by other organizations, for example, NIWIC? So everyone has their areas of expertise. And while there is some overlap in certain groups, the reality is that there are syscoms for specific activities and functions. The tab is a mechanism to kind of help unify the understanding of those different groups and where there's overlap. And through different architectures like DeFeo, it can be standardized and understood so that it's unique and specific to the tailored environments and meeting the mission needs. Um, in addition to that, when it comes to any type of baseline change, there's always a sequence of whether it be you know, in modernization or in backfit, that there is a sequence of events of when it is appropriate and affordable to make changes to a ship system. And I think as long as we're in schedule, like most acquisition workforces, and we're in sequence with that, then we will be successful. Over. Thank you, Dan. These questions coming in now, audience, go ahead. <laughs> How will NAVC implement these architecture? I mean, not the, I just read that one. Uh, do you have MBSE models with detail for cybersecurity? Yes. I think that's going to be in some of the presentation that's coming up next, too. Okay. How much do you deal with automated systems? Uh, it's a fairly generic statement. I'm trying to understand the question better. Um, there's a lot of systems that have automation built into them. So I guess I'm better trying to better understand the question. Over. Uh, maybe maybe um, uh, the person who submitted that question can resubmit. Um, the next question is, have you considered how much leverage of third party industry cybersecurity certifications at the equipment systems level like ABS type approvals to support NAFC efforts? When we have, uh, we did some of our evaluations, the different uh, curriculums, I think a lot has been taken into account. Um, me off, off the hand cup, I'd have to ask our lead on that one, but I would say that it would probably be taken into account. They've gone to a lot of extent to make sure that things unique to our mission capabilities have been evaluated and that the different mechanisms available with funding obviously always in play that they would be taken into account and utilized as most as possible. Over. Okay, thank you. Um, and so a clarification of that question was like anywhere from ICS to autonomous vessels and continuing is like, how much do you deal with automated systems? So autonomous definitely falls a lot into the POUSC realm. Um, so that's definitely covered in a different PEO. Um, and I think there's a lot of collaboration that can occur between the different directorates and PEOs within NAFC. Over. And, and I will also add with the uh, development of, of those systems, uh, 
all of the tech warrant holders, including our cybersecurity tech warrant, warrant holder, is involved to, to, to vet and um, ensure that cybersecurity needs are met as uh, the specifications and designs for, for those types of systems are developed over. And that does come into play both in the acquisition lifecycle and gate changes also within SCDs and ship change documents. Like, um, over. Okay. Um, what, what is the new and evolving technology review path for O3 or is there a single point of entry? Can you state the question again, please? Okay, sorry. What is the new and evolving technology review path for O3? Is there a single point of entry? I'm guessing they're saying like, how do you submit your new and evolving technologies through NAVC O3? Uh, there's been a lot of different opportunities between RIFs and SIBRs and then other uh, contract mechanisms depending on the opportunity. So I guess it would be dependent on the different program offices or opportunities within CO3. I think as we mature as a new organization, um, that will become more evident over time. Over. Okay, and uh, I'll probably take two more questions because there's a lot, but then um, um, audience, uh, we will, I will be submitting all of these questions to the NASI um, O3 office, and then they'll be able to answer them and be able to send out like a blast email so everybody has the same information and have all the questions and answers so that they can make sure they get answered, okay? Um, one, uh, two more questions. So uh, one is, uh, will Seaport NXG be the contracting vehicle of choice? If not, will the acquisitions be posted through GSA schedules? I'd have to reach out to our program manager on that one. That's definitely something I don't have the answer to. Over. Okay. Um, uh, how do you distribute and capture training and knowledge? So Navy LMS or industry or through industry certifications? Sorry, can you state that again, please? Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, how do you distribute and capture training and knowledge? Uh, for example, like uh, through Navy LMS or through industry certification certifications? It's a mix of both. Um, most of the training has some form of certification, whether it's used for continuous learning points um, or it's an actual certification, as we mentioned before, with the SANS classes or other um, classes like a you know, certified ethical hacker. So there's a lot of opportunity through um, both inside the government with those trained certificates and continuous learning or outside using third party industry and utilizing those certifications over. Let, let me okay. just add, and all, all of that complements what the baseline NAVC engineering training requirements are for the engineering competency, which is managed through our DEWEA Defense Acquisition Workforce Improvement um, uh, Program. So it, uh, the engineering uh, group is required to have uh, uh, DEWEA level three for, for systems engineering just just like all of the other um, uh, groups across uh, the engineering um, profile at NAFSI. So that complements what, what Chris just said, over. Okay, and the last question is, can you please go into more detail about what expectations or impacts that CO3 anticipates for vendor CMMC levels with regards to SCRM? Oh, you're on mute, Chris, the whole time. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we couldn't have a Zoom meeting without one of those, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so outside of anyone who can do lip reading, what I was saying is a lot of that is being handled at higher levels of DOD and has been kind of growing since the 2016 timeframe as we get more guidance from um, DOD and SecNav when it comes to how we're handling CMMC and what the expectations are between primes and subs as we learn more about how these DFARS clause are going to be implemented. So it's definitely a, um, it's a growing process. It's a new process and it's coming from um, high down to 
all of us at the syscom level and to industry over okay thank you chris so much as i'm pulling up the next slide we will be presenting then my speaker can come on Yeah, it looks like we're at the back of the presentation. I'm yeah, sorry about that. I saw that. <laughs> can you can you hear me? Am I coming in loud and clear? Hopefully, loud, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. So, afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Custer. I am the uh, program manager for uh, Model Base Product Support, and we'll be going through a, a nice brief on what we're what we're working on in terms of uh, logistics uh, IT applications um, and kind of give you the the lay of land where where an FC is headed and, and where big Navy's headed um, so if we go to the next uh, next slide it's just a brief uh, brief agenda and then we'll actually get into the good stuff so if you can skip to slide four we'll we'll get started here. So let's see. Yeah, uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. So um, uh, model-based product support. It's a BCAT two program, and really the the purpose was to uh, look at our core uh, configuration management, provisioning, uh, spares, um, and tech data management applications. Um, and there are 11 legacy applications that support those um, uh, those capabilities within NAFSI and rationalize them using a modern PLM solution. And that's really what uh, what we're trying to trying to accomplish. Um, in the bigger context of where Navy's going, there's there's over 200 plus, uh, logistics IT applications ac across the entire uh, portfolio. And where we want to do is we want to come up with an integrated data environment and rationalize all those applications, which means sunsetting all those applications and coming up with a holistic PLM solution um, that integrates each element of the logistics um, uh, elements into into an integrated system. So if you take a look at how we've architected our, our applications across the years, we have very specialized, non-integrated uh, uh, applications that support uh, maintenance planning or do configuration management or do training or do um, manpower personnel training and, and, and other things. But they're all stovepiped. They're not integrated. And there's no really, uh, you know, authoritative source of data. Uh, more importantly, there's no digital thread link to the actual product design. So um, these are kind of the challenges we've been taking on with, with model-based product support is to resolve all those issues and, and, and come up with a with a uh, application that, that is able to maintain digital thread from design through sustainment, as well as integrate all the, the logistics product data elements and applications into a into a single PLM solution. So that's that's kind of where we're going. Um, in addition to what we've been working on, um, there is an uh, organization. So ASN has been doing this this digital IT transformation, and um, and that was uh, executed about uh, about four years ago. The end result was the stand-up of a new organization called PEO MLB, which is uh, Manpower Logistics and Business Systems. And they're now tasked with uh, essentially coming up with a, a Navy solution for, for log IT. Um, and model-based product support, of course, we're, we're folded up under the, the Navy PLM solution. And more importantly, we're also um, aligned under under the, the the MLB construct. So if you take a look at um, how MLB is constructed, um, in terms of uh, PLM solutions, there, there's two core solutions. One um, in place 
um, that was uh, created by the the Navy Air uh, community to support the aviation community. And then there's model based product support, which which is the the counterpart for for maritime. Under Navy PLM, those two solutions are are aligned and get integrated um, with uh, POMLB. And and uh, once again, we're you know instead of having two solutions for aviation maritime, it's going to be a single uh, Navy solution that supports both both environments. Next slide. Okay, and this is just a brief uh, of the, the CO3R organization, the, the core team. Uh, Noel uh, Smith is our, our uh, director um, and, and, uh, and what we call the, the big brain. So she's the, the force behind everything. Uh, Ann McKinnon and uh, Jill Maynard are, are basically our, our chief PAPAMs and Ashley Holloway's chief architect. Um, this organization chart is, is you know, as I said, it, it's really the, the CO3R um, core organization. But really, if you take a look at our extended team, we have support across all the uh, all the warfare centers and have a pretty pretty expansive team uh, on the government side. So um, pretty much all the as I said, all the warfare centers are are our major players in in, in model based product support development. So that kind of gives us the uh, the lay of the land here. Uh, in terms of organizational responsibilities, it also gives you a good uh, um, uh, good list of points of contact. So if you have any questions, you can always uh, you know call um, any of the, any of the people on the on this uh, organization chart to to ask ask questions. So um, and of course, uh, I'm right there as deputy director. So if you have any questions too, you can always call me. Um, that said, we'll uh, skip the next slide and go to uh, slide seven. And and really, what I you know kind of want to do is just kind of quickly level set on uh, and give you a couple slides on 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 MLB and and really uh, um, where digital transformation is going in general. Kind of give you the the the, the uh, top level view, and then we'll go into uh, more detail on on model based product board and what we're working on. So if we could uh, go to uh, slide seven. Did the slide not switch because I think my service is acting up? Yeah, it's still on the uh, still on the org chart. Oh no! Okay, yeah, one there's, second. There's always <laughs> technical difficulties, some bandwidth problems. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's coming back in. Sorry, <laughs> bear with us. <laughs> yeah, never, never fails. Uh... So anyway, um, and, and, and just to kind of keep going through while, while we're working on the technical issues. So uh, the, the Navy uh, Log IT portfolio is is basically uh, comprised of all the logistics applications that support both, um, that are used both a, a float and a shore. Um, and, and basically they're, they're used to not only manage, but um, maintain both naval platforms, weapon systems, keep them operationally available. Uh, log IT is really synonymous with uh, readiness and sustainment. Um, and once again, the, the ultimate objective is to enable the same amount of platforms and weapon systems at their required re readiness levels. And we'll get a little more into this when we go into the, the uh, Navy Common Readiness Model and, 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 and that, that capability that we're fielding under Model Based Product Support. Um, next slide is, okay, well, really, what, is, what do we mean by um, Naval Logistics IT? And POMLB is divided um, divided uh, naval logistics into basically four basic product lines. So we have uh, naval repair, uh, naval maintenance repair and overhaul, uh, NMRO, Navy supply chain management, uh, Navy PLM, and and integrated uh, data infrastructure. So the three core uh, capabilities. Uh, of course, maintenance, repair, and overhaul, supply chain management, PLM. Um, those have specialized applications that support, uh, you know, everything from um, uh, OI and D level maintenance, as well as shipyard support. 
um, the supply chain management, um, which is uh, broken out between uh, DLA and NAVSUP, who uh, manage and distribute most of the the parts and and uh, and goods that support uh, support ships and weapon systems. Navy PLM is is really housing all the data um, that is um, developed not only from the OEMs and the shipbuilders in terms of uh, 3D data product data models and, and design packages, but also all the logistics product data that's associated with that, that design, um, which is configuration managed within the, the PLM environment. And then the, the IDE is basically your, your, crowd, your, your cloud infrastructure. And it's, 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 it's the, the common denominator between those, those three product lines. So um, the IDE is, is basically the vehicle we're using to exchange data um, between MRO, SCM, and PLM environments. And the next slide is, is the first picture and, and, and kind of gives you the, the, the OV1 view of, of what that means with, with the various product lines. Um, so if we skip to the, the next slide. And hopefully it's is it to... is it gone again yep oh my okay yeah. wonderful digital tools <laughs> um as i'm working this um mike i might need you to be a backup i got the slides but it looks like my internet is acting up we're ahead of schedule yeah. audience if so you're good. here with us <laughs> Yeah, if you can uh, go back okay. to uh, slide nine. Okay. Okay, it should be coming now. Ah, there you, go. you got it. Perfect. So, uh, as I said, the the IDE is is really the the, the cloud persona. Whoops. Um. Yeah. For for one slide. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like delayed. Like I, I clicked like a minute ago and this is just happening. <laughs> Gotta have fun okay. with it. <laughs> so, yep. Um, as you can see, the, the IDE is really the core um, core cloud environment. And then uh, NPLM, S SCM, and, and uh, uh, Navy MRO are, are basically your, your, your product lines. But you can kind of see, you know, that that environment not only provides communication across uh, the product lines, but also um, the, the the communication avenue between uh, between ship and inshore sites. So, um, you know, it's it's three product lines integrated with a with a um, cloud IDE environment that that integrates everything. Uh, the next slide is is basically um, this pictorial, just put in terms of specifically Navy PLM and what our objectives are. Um, and it, it it basically just uh, kind of reiterates some of the some of the same themes that are in this slide, um, and just puts it into a, a slightly different context. Um, you know, the main thing to get out of the, the the next slide is is once again, you know, um, you know, the, the themes of you know managing digital thread, managing um, and a configuration. Uh, managed uh, technical design package with all the sporting logistics data, having the ability to understand and and do readiness costs uh, optimization and modeling, supporting digital uh, manufacturing, and, and really just being able to 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 uh, um, take advantage of of the the core capabilities that that most Navy PLM tools. Uh, um, are used for so managing bills of material, doing your root cause analysis, doing your engineering uh, change management, quality control, all 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 those center center functions that are uh, important with PLM. And then uh, the last slide before we kind of go off and, and start really talking about model based product support is, is really kind of the the overall architecture and how we're integrating um, the aviation and maritime um, PLM solutions. So you can see we we're actually using um, the aviation size using team center, uh, maritimes using uh, uh, PTC windchill products. 
Um, and then uh, there is an enterprise service bus um, that um, that we're using um, between the two uh, PLM capabilities to uh, to basically share and exchange information and and align our our efforts going forward. So. Um, kind of get into the, the good stuff and, and hopefully be able to play a, a short video. Um, so if we skip ahead to the log IT challenges, uh, this is really um, kind of variations of the same theme, how we, how we got to where we are, which is, you know, the existing tools were designed in the 1980s. They were stovepipe systems, very... Uh, non-user friendly, um, very hard to, 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 to main, maintain, uh, uh, operate, maintain, um, hosting costs were, were through the roof, very hard to, to maintain uh, cybersecurity uh, requirements for all those applications. Um, and, and as you said, the, the, you know, the, with the database being fragmented, um, you know, there is a, you know, we didn't know the, you know, what the authoritative really uh, authoritative data source was um, and comparing information from one, one data system to the other was, was really, was really difficult. So, um, you know, once again, you know, rationalizing and integrating all those IT applications, bringing them up to uh, um, uh, a modern standard uh, equivalent to what uh, industry is using PLM became the, the the solution of choice. So with that, we can skip to slide 14 and hopefully play a, a short uh, short video on on model based product support. And this should give you a, a pretty good um, rundown of what we're doing and why. All right, we made me, a net look. <laughs> yep. Fingers crossed. Just asking, is there sound attached to this? There hopefully is. Okay, let me, I need to, hold on one second. Today we are talking about Model-Based Product Support, or MBPS. So what about MBPS? In the Navy's current environment, executing logistics sustainment is extremely inefficient and tedious because we work with so many disparate logistics databases. Even when you pull data, there is no guarantee you have the latest and greatest information. You could be dependent on 10 different databases and logins to access the data you need. In many cases, you are also dependent on other people to gather the data you need. How is the Navy addressing the need to update logistics data systems? Model-based product support, MBPS. MBPS centrally stores all the product support data you need to do your job. MBPS provides modeling and simulation and data analytics capabilities to enable data-driven decisions to meet readiness requirements and support the fleet. In this course, we will take a closer look at MBPS and its capabilities. Let's begin. Select the next arrow to continue. Okay, and you know, once again, it's good good summary of 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 what what model-based product support is and um, and that should set the stage for the the more detailed uh, couple slides we have here so if we can uh, skip the slide uh, slide 17 now Almost. okay so kind of getting back to, to, to what we are, as I mentioned, we're a BCAT2 ca category, uh, uh, um, which is uh, equivalent to an ACAT2 program. Uh, we've been uh, using basically two um, contract um, vehicles to, uh, 
to develop in in field uh, um, capability. So the OTA um, uh, or other transaction authority, um, which we've been uh, working through uh, ACC Orlando, which is uh, the Army uh, um, uh, PO Stry um, Army uh, Army Command. Actually, it's an Army vehicle, but um, the OTA is is really um, used to that we're using to um, develop our uh, our uh, capability and our and, and essentially our prototyping effort. Uh, the OTA is is extremely useful. So um, you know, I kind of always stress this is that the OTA really allowed us to to um, it, it's a very flexible vehicle, but it allowed us to build a, a dream team of uh, of software vendors uh, with Accenture Federal Services as as a lead integrator. Um, and we have uh, members including uh, PTC. Uh, Anarch, uh, GPSL, uh, Beast Code, and, and Systicon that are uh, helping uh, fill out and develop uh, the, the, the core capabilities for model-based product support. And then we have a, um, uh, a specifically software as a service contract with PTC that, that basically we're using to transition um, those capabilities into, into production and, and support um, through that contract vehicle. Um, but yeah, you know, as I said, once again, the, the OTA is very effective. So, um, if you don't know what it, what it is, highly recommend you, uh, uh, Google it and go on the web and investigate. Cause, uh, as I said, the OTA provides a lot of flexibility and, and, and has really helped us, uh, accelerate and, de uh, develop a, a set of capabilities in extremely rapid fashion. So we be began the OTA and, in uh, in uh, December of uh, of uh, nineteen, and we're getting ready to uh, to uh, field our first set of uh, MVPs end of this fiscal year. So, very powerful. Anyway, uh, moving right along to uh, the next slide, slide eighteen. So, model based product support is uh, comprised of three uh, basic capabilities. So. We have the uh, Navy product data management, which is really your uh, configuration managed 3D um, uh, data model, along with your supporting uh, uh, tech data package. Um, all your logistics product data um, is contained within a singular environment, um, and it's integrated and tied directly to, to the design of the system. Uh, the Navy Common Readiness Model. So on top of uh, all that information, um, we have the, the readiness models for those systems that we're um, planning to create and and sustain, um, which provides the ability to, uh, to understand what uh, readiness is achieved and um, be able to understand what the, what the costs and investment strategies are for, for operations work through the life of the system. Uh, and then NDART, um, which is the Navy Data Acquisition Requirements Tool. And, and this is really the, the set of uh, data standards and specifications that we're using to, to ensure that all the programs are buying the right data at the right time within their program to, uh, to build and populate the uh, um, NPDM and NCRM modules. So uh, we're using what we're calling the S-Series Plus set of data standards. So it's, um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the uh, commercial standards S-Series specs for for logistics, which is uh, S-1000D, S-3000L, um, S-6000T, uh, which all provide uh, um, bits and pieces of, of, of the logistics uh, uh, product data, uh, along with uh, some of the uh, the mill specs and standards that that we all know and love, like uh, GIA Triple O Seven, uh, Mill Standard Thirty One Thousand, and Mill uh, Mill Standard Thirty Thirty Four. So it's it's the you know as I said, it's um, it, it's uh, a hybrid between the commercial standards and and some of the the, the mill specs that are still in use. Um, but once again, it's you know. Um, if you take a look at how we've done acquisitions, it's ver been very, very wild west. So each program office kind of develops their own sets of, of data standards and specs and procures data in their own way. Well, this is the, this is the, the tool that, that helps program offices to select the right data. But more importantly, it really standardizes the approach and, and, and ensures that we're buying 
the same data sets and standards um, going forward across the board. And once again, uh, if you kind of look through the the flow of the the diagram here, um, you know you see those sows and, and seed rules are really um, what's put on uh, the procurement and statement contracts for, for you know uh, to procure weapon systems and, and ships. And that information is used to build and populate uh, NPDM and NCRM going forward. And once again, that provides your sustainment and readiness data that uh, are, are used to support the weapon systems and and uh, and ships going forward. Uh, next three slides just just basically kind of um, goes into a little more detail on on each of the three capabilities. Um, NPDM, uh, I, I think we've kind of uh, beaten to death, but once again, uh, configuration manage tech data package closed loop process. So uh, like all good configuration managed systems, it's closed loop um, process, meaning that um, from the initiation of the change to the installation um, on board ship, uh, all that information is maintained um, and tracked in accordance with uh, um, um, uh, good configuration management practices. Um, once again, we're managing baseline data, but more importantly, we're maintaining that digital thread from, from that actual system design through, through installation for the life of the system. Um, the next slide goes into a little more detail on, on the, the common readiness model. So once again, um, it's, it's really a, a standardized set of capabilities that are built off of uh, Systicon's Opus uh, suite of tools. Um, it, it really gives us the ability to, to, to do something we haven't done before, which is really understand what the cost of readiness is and what um, decisions and, uh, and financial impacts are for, for sustainment and sustainability. Um, it, it really helps us understand exactly, you know, what, you know, operational readiness is achieved how it can be maintained through the life of the system, and if there are deltas or differences, where they where they are, and, and how that impacts uh, impacts the fleet. Uh, more importantly, we kind of view this as is also a warfighting capability uh, because it's not just a tool that the program offices use. Um, this capability can be given to the fleet unit commanders, so they can do things like understand um, what the you know, if their deployment cycle is extended 30 days um, and I'm performing an anti-air mission, uh, what failures can I expect? What parts am I, am I going to need for the, that extended, thir uh, extended 30 days? And what do I need to do in order to, to, to ensure I maintain uh, my systems at the, at the optimum readiness? So, you know, once again, this is not just an IT system. It, it, we're looking at this as, as providing a warfighting capability. Um, and then uh, the next slide, slide 21, just goes into more detail on, 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 on uh, NDART, uh, which gives you uh, um, a little more uh, information, but still it's, it's pretty much in, in concert with what we said. It, it gives you that, that contract data package. Slide 22 um, is the um, product overview, um, but with a uh, um, overlay of what IT systems were actually rationalizing uh, this fiscal year. So CDM, DOA, RAD Web, uh, ICAPS, ADIS Ashore, NESDR, TIDMIS, Navlog, TD, NMAT, MR, MRDB partially, um, uh, uh, the readiness based fairing, Tiger ASA models, and SPAR-T are all being uh, rationalized by bundle based product support, which means being replaced. Um, NDE, uh, PMS MIS are, are targeted for future integrations. Um, um, so eventually we'll be, uh, we'll be rationalizing those capabilities as we, as we move forward under, under Navy PLM. Um, but once again, it kind of gives you a, a really good um, overview of, of what applications are going away, what's being replaced, and where those applications fit within, within the uh, three capabilities of, of model-based product support. And then we're almost done. So we're in the home stretch here. Um, the next slide just kind of gives you, uh, 
you know, uh, another maturity roadmap, but it, it, it goes from consolidating um, all the data sources um, and, and integrating them within those three uh, MPPS capabilities, providing a more connected um, solution, which includes, um, uh, you know, use of um, integrating data um, through through the legacy um, I, or legacy programs, um, uh, but more importantly, as we move into this analytically model predictive, um, now we're getting to the point where, you know, we're moving from legacy to actually buying, you know, complete 3D data um, uh, data models and product data uh, from industry, ingesting that into uh, MPBS, and then managing that and maintaining that that digital thread from design through sustainment. So um, it kind of gives you the, the, the overall roadmap and, and approach. And then the last uh, last slide here, um, now that we're in the home stretch, um, kind of just reiterates the point. So model-based product support, digital transformation at, uh, effort to enable uh, programs to relate sustainment resources to mission readiness. Uh, it enables programs to establish the digital trend and uh, create uh, uh, digital twin models um, to optimize lifecycle costs and, and maximize operational availability. And it's a, um, a technology that's that that's basically using and dependent on COTS cap capabilities rather than, you know, stovepipe, GOTS, government um, off the shelf built capabilities. So once again, we want to be able to uh, rapidly lift and shift as uh, uh, as solutions and technology matures um, and get out of the uh, the business of, of managing IT systems and, and give that back to industry and take advantage of, of the, the technology that's out there in the, in, the, in the industry sector. So that's our uh, that's our brief. I know it's a lot to take in 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 uh, in 30 minutes. So uh, we'll uh, pause for uh, for questions. All righty, let me queue up some questions. Got a lot. Okay. So yeah, there's, there's a few here. <laughs> how does the effort, how does this effort affect DATAMS and DITPR dash DON and will the, or will these two databases go away? Well, um, model-based product support is is the program of record. So you know we've got uh, you know different on um, datums entries for for model-based product support. Um, uh, yeah, uh, ITPRs. Uh, we're uh, yeah, it's um, it, it, it's a challenge, um, and it's a challenge because you know. You know, we're standing up a new new capability, but at the same time, we're um, sunsetting legacy applications and still having to manage and maintain some of that capability as we move forward. So, um, it's a it's a mixed bag. It's a lot of challenges, but it's it's kind of the nature of the beast. Okay, um, is 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 all or most of this digital readiness for? Afloat units, I ask because there are other Navy entities that plan for and provide what I call corporate-wide IT services, for example, flank speed. Yes, and, and this is one of the reasons why um, PEO MLB was, was stood up. So you've, you've got um, um, basically PEO Digital that, that maintains and, and is charged with managing most of the, the supporting IT systems, including, including uh, uh, um, flank speed and, and a lot of the, 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 the business applications that we use. And then PMLB manages the entire logistics IT portfolio. So um, everything from the headquarters applications that we use um, for logistics um, through the applications that are installed at the deck plate that are in use by the um, uh, shore facilities and and uh, and deck plate sailor. So it's a holistic environment. So we're not talking, you know, we're not talking, you know, a individual systems anymore. We're talking an entire IT infrastructure um, that we're supporting. Over. 
Okay, thank you. Um, who leads the integration and infrastructure IDE efforts? Well, once again, that you know that's that's BO MLB. So um, and um, Les Hubbard is is really the you know the SES that's uh, that's running shotgun over over the entire IT portfolio to include the IDE. Thank you. Um, how do Navy Logistic IT systems capture the accounting transactions involved with logistics, and do these systems integrate in any way with Navy ERP? And it got some tough ones for you. Yeah, and the answer is yes. Um, and there is a whole um, host of of issues in terms of um, um, audit and fire compliance, as well as DELMS uh, compliance as well. So anything managing, of course, um, financial transactions is, is auditable. So um, we're looking very closely at that, at that thread and, and making sure that, it, you know, we're able to, to pass, uh, pass that financial information intact um, through through logistics IT systems into ERP as which is our financial uh, accounting system of record. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is: uh, What are the plans for resolving and harmonizing technology uh, technical data across NAVC, OEM, and other integrated digital environments? Yeah, it, it's really. You know, once again, the, the first step is the, to actually integrate um, the, the disparate information sources um, so we can start actually uh, using uh, uh, process auto automation to, to start um, fixing some of the, the disparities. So um, if you just take a look at um, how the how the the databases were configured it, it it's a lot like going to the card catalog in your local library so there's a lot of cross references from one database to another to another to another um and unfortunately um a lot of the information same information is recreated in these other databases so it's a matter of you know understanding what the authoritative source is and then squeezing out and, and making sure that um, everybody's using that information as opposed to um, some of those, those secondary sources. And, and then once we get, you know, the thought is, is once we get everything integrated, it, you know, we'll be able to, uh, to cleanse and, and start purging some of, some of that, that data that's incorrect and use it, you know, and, and use that, that data from the authoritative source to, 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 to uh, enable the cleansing, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, the next question is, what is the, uh, what is the anticipate matrix of custom development of applications versus buying customizing uh, commercial applications for NPLM, NMRO, and MSCM? Um, well, actually, that's the approach we don't want to take. So, uh, you know, it, it, yeah. in the past, and, and I won't name systems, but we've done that. We've taken a, a perfectly good commercial application and customized the, the crap out of it just to um, can, conform to our, our current business processes. We want to do the exact opposite. We, we really want to you know, use uh, commercial capability as much as possible without modifying it um, and only modifying it if, if absolutely necessary, um, you know, and then once again, be really critical of, of our, our, our business processes. So we want to challenge that, that notion of, well, we've always done business this way. Well, why, if you've got technology that can Either surpass or 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 make that that process obsolete. So, you know, once again, um, you know, we kind of shy away. We we don't want to customize or or configure um, a commercial product. Plus, it 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 
kind of limits our options once we once we do invest in that. So, you know, we have uh, you know contract lengths of 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 about five years. So, if let's say we want to move from one PLM provider to another, and we've got a heavily customized solution, we're not going to be able to lift and shift rapidly um, when that contract ends, support contract ends, and we've got to migrate to a different solution. So we want to keep things as, as out of the box as possible. Over. Thank you. And the next question is, a many efficiency initiatives, application rationa uh, rationalization, fail to fully grasp the depth of technical engineering required to rationalize successfully. How do you plan to engineer, validate, and implement the appropriate integration of technology successfully? Hmm. Yeah, that, that is a, you know, that, that kind of gets right, right to the heart of the matter. Um, yeah. The first set of um, applications is was was pretty pretty easy because they were our applications. We understood what the the requirements were. Um, as we rationalize and and address the additional two hundred plus systems within the portfolio, um, it's it's a concerted effort um, that has folks across the syscoms um, supporting and. I mean, there's, you know, there, there's, there's, there's no easy way. You've got to, you got to put the time in, um, understand what the, the requirements for each of the applications are and be able to decompose it in, in a way uh, where you can give those requirements to, to industry to, to help develop what that, what that, what that solution is going to be. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big problem and, and it's, it's really, um, you know, kind of in the, in the approach that, that MLB has been ta been taking. So, um, they've kind of broken, broken things down into, uh, in, into, uh, um, cross-functional teams to, to actually, um, decompose those requirements across each of those three product lines. So we have a, a group of folks that are, are working specifically to, uh, on these requirements for, for supply chain management, MRO and, and PLM. That's the that's the best answer I can can uh, um, can come up with, um, you know Ashley or anybody if it, you know if you have a better uh, better answer I'm I'm all ears so Ashley I'm just the help <laughs> well no, different, different Ashley we have a, oh, okay. uh, some of our team in in the background uh, unfortunately Ashley dialed in she tried to speak up but apparently we're not hearing her so I guess the whatever dial in she is. Uh, she's not connecting. Oh, um, do you have, I can pull her up to a panelist if I have her. Oh, well, I can chat it. Sorry. Um, Ashley, can you raise your hand in the chat if you're in the chat and I'll pull you over to answer. If we can't get her over as, as, Ashley, the moderator said we can further flesh out some of the answers yeah. um, whenever they come to us and we'll post them. Yeah, it looks like yeah, Ashley's still trying to trying to connect. So yeah, let's let, let's keep going. Okay. Okay, so uh, LOGIT appears to be facing oh, yeah. some massive. Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, sorry. LOG IT appears to be facing some massive integration challenges with dozens of legacy systems and hundreds of current systems of record. I see lots of arrows in these slides. So do these represent custom point to point code or what is the overall integration strategy that NAVC is pursuing to get information into MBPS? Yeah, um, you know, once again, you know, starting with with the you know the the legacy applications that that we own internally within within CO3R, it's been fairly fairly easy to do those integrations because we, we've had um, interface control agreements um, set up with with most of the interfacing applications that that we've been uh, 
uh, using uh, specifically uh, with with CDMDOA, which is probably the the, the kind of the integration hub. Um, and CMDOA, for those who aren't familiar with it, is is the core configuration status accounting tool for for NAFC, and that had um, thirty plus um, applications that were um, that were interfaced with it uh, to uh, um, to pull data. So, uh, and we've you know we've been working closely with those with those interface owners to make sure that. Um, you know, we understood what their what their data requirements were, and 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 now we could replicate that that data um, interaction as we move from from the legacy into model based product support. So um, that that first step was was fairly easy. But as we take on, uh, you know, each additional system, it's it's a it's a bigger and bigger problem, uh, mostly because a lot of the the IT applications are. Um, uh, you know, are, are very parochial in, in how they do it. Um, there's also a lot of duplication, so I, I don't want to give the impression that there 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 are 200 you know plus unique s solutions. There are there are variations on on common themes, whether they're supporting uh, you know uh, tech data management or configuration status accounting or configuration management in general. Um, so there are multiple multiple applications that do the same thing. Same with like uh, obsolescence management. There are like seven different applications that support obsolescence management. Um, but the core capability is 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 really what we're what we're trying what, what we're trying to what we're trying to rationalize. Um, so as you as you attack those systems, that you know it comes from like 200 systems down to you know down to to, to 50, and then trying to manage those interfaces and understand that becomes a little easier, but it's still still a complex problem. Okay, um, Ashley Holloway, our chief architect, is made her way onto the, the line now. She wants to circle back to that last question and add something. All right. Hi, Ashley. can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, so circling back to that last question about the engineering and validating the solution. So some of the things that we've done specifically for MBPS is we've taken an agile approach to our whole uh, configuration um, cycle. So we've you know, done chunks of the requirements that Paul talked about earlier, and then um, basically utilizing human center design as part of the process to show that back to not just um, ourselves as part of the you know program office, but also um, other stakeholders throughout the community that are currently using some of those legacy systems to get that immediate feedback. So we've been doing that over the last year, year and a half, um, and doing the same process from a data migration um, perspective. So um, we've got some key SMEs that have been helping us with uh, data validation, data cleanup. We just finished our first uh, rehearsal, uh, one with looking at the CMDA and this data and, and prepping for rehearsal two. So those are the types of things that we've been doing over the course of the last year and a half with um, human centered design events, uh, end user testing events as well. Um, we have two more of those coming up this fiscal year um, to help users get more uh, engaged into the solution set. Um, and numerous uh, other outreach events, our, our lead uh, organizational change management, uh, APM is not on the phone, uh, Candace Achoki, but every month we have a lunch and learn looking at different aspects of the capability as well as we have uh, quarterly roadshows that focuses on you know, different areas of model-based product support. So a lot of engagement with the user community, as well as uh, some of the, a handful of those working directly with us um, on the program. Over. Okay, thank you so much. I had to come off mute. All right, and I'm glad you could join us, Ashley. I said, not me, Ashley, you might Ashley twin. <laughs> um, uh, so two, this is uh, similar questions. Uh, which OTA consortium does NAFCO3 are used to promulgate their needs? And then uh, someone says, that, yeah, you mentioned, um, and which, which OTA consortium, like you mentioned the Army, is the CMG C5, is this the C, MGC5 consortium. No, it, it's actually uh, um, T Rex. Um, so it's uh, PEO Stry, out of PEO Stry, uh, and AAC Orlando. So. 
Okay, and then that, and then it, I guess the other one was what does uh, which consortium does NASCO three R use to promulgate their needs? Yeah, T Rex. Oh, T Rex. Okay. Okay. Uh, should should the cloud storage cost scale well beyond what you have budgeted across uh, FYDP, or what is the plan to get the data back? I'm sorry, Ashley, I was trying, I didn't catch the last part of the question. I heard cloud storage and I was trying to look and see if I saw it in the QA, but I don't, looks like it's popped up yet. Can you repeat the question? Okay, yep. Um, should should the cloud storage cost scale well beyond what you have budgeted across the FYDP? What's the plan to get the data back? I think it's two questions in one. So, so based on where we currently are right now, we, we looked at estimation of the legacy systems that we're migrating and tracking to, uh, you know, storage size requirements is, is how we initially baseline. And then we plan for pro, uh, projection of growth over the fit up. Um, and I think we'll just have to be assessing that every year. I, and at this point, I, we do not anticipate. Um, and I, I think the last part of the question was reverting the data back. Um, so I'm not quite sure what that question is. But um, again, like over the fit up, we've planned for growth in the data. Um, and we've done our initial baseline assessment based on the legacy systems uh, storage capacity to date. Over. Okay, thank you. Um, how will how will log IT align with Noble? It appears Navy log IT will rationalize NTCSS. Now comments etc. Yeah, and, and Noble's the uh, the piece of MRO that, that's basically supporting the 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 deck plate sailor as well as the, the, the maintenance activities. So yes, Noble is is, is part of the, the the PO MLB product lines. Uh, it's included in MRO and and we're integrating with it and providing um the, the bulk of the information from NPLM to, to support Noble and, and MRO. Oh, I was on mute. <laughs> We're gonna do that at least four more times. I'm calling it. Uh, yes. Um, uh, so, uh, how do you plan on harmonizing domain-specific data definitions from varying product model systems to be used by the shipbuilders? Is that there? Do you see that question? Yeah, we're 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 kind of thinking, yeah. uh, <laughs> trying yeah, to. I, did, I think there's a delay, so I don't. I see the question basically like after I answer it. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I I see the question now. So, um, Paul, I'll start it off, and then uh, feel free to, to jump in. So, as far as the um, the product model systems, I, there's another effort within Log IT looking at all the uh, the data sets across, not just in PLM, but in MRO and uh, in, in SCM. Um, that effort has been, uh, was initiated um, by our largest consumer, the fleet, as well as um, some of the other uh, folks that have been working in NAFC. So that data working group's been uh, working, I want to say, over at least the last year to, to look at um, the domain-specific uh, type of items. And I think some of the key work that, at least from the MAPS side, we've tried to engage with, uh, you know, the Columbia class and uh, Virginia class folks as well to uh, try to understand what the shipbuilders are doing. And it's really a process of what data is the government going to sustain and maintain for the life cycle 
of you know the ships and systems that we're procuring versus what is the OEM going to maintain and, and where does that need to be stored and consumed. So I, I think that's an overall process that's still being worked with um, with O5. Um, we uh, had an initial kickoff of a you know, working group specifically trying to address some of those with the with the four class. So I, I think it's an ongoing evolution. Um, there, there's no answer that we have right now today, but it is being worked over. Yeah, and there's almost two answers to that. You know, there's there's the the management of the legacy data fields and legacy data, and then there's the data model that we want to start migrating to. And I, I know we've we've had uh, a couple uh, NSRP projects that are actually looking at uh, data standards. Um, whether it was, you know, we started looking purely at the the S series logistics um, tech data last year, and then it's expanded out to to looking at all the you know the data that 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 should be procured to support, uh, um, you know, um, uh, you know, a ship design and, and, you know, how, how that is, uh, folding out. And that's an ongoing effort, uh, ongoing NSRP project right now. Okay. I'm going to read the, the question of how is digital data being protected? For example, readiness, for example, readiness data. This information can provide quite useful to our adversaries. Additionally, will protection mechanisms limit the ability of individuals who need access to this information to obtain it? And that's a question for Ashley. Yeah, I don't know why I'm not seeing the questions um, pop up. I'm in the open, and I don't see that one, Ashley. Um, this one's from Patrick Turner. It's in at 12.09. It's uh, like, it's in at 12.09. Do you see that one? Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's really getting to, you know, a, a couple things, which is protection of, 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 of the data within the model. So it's, it's both... You know, you, we, we can kind of cover both, um, you know, data aggregation as well as um, the the different types of data with, you know, that we're protecting, whether it's, you know, uh, CUI, UNNPI, or, or, or classified uh, going forward. So, um, you know, w once again, it, it, you know, there, there are challenges. So having an integrated data environment, um, and all the information contained within, you know, sporting weapon system in, in one environment, just by sheer aggregation, elevates the the classification levels. Um, and then there's the you know the requirements that that are laid on us to to project um, classified UNMPI data. So we're all working through that, um, which results in in a couple things. I mean, the environment has to be accredited, or the cloud environment has to be accredited to to ensure that the data is protected. Um, you know, the, the access to the information, um, is, is done by function and need to know. Um, so there is, you know, that limitation on, on who can actually get in and log in and what their roles and response, functional responsibilities are. Um, and then on, on top of all that, there's a security classification guide that, that, um, has to be developed in order to, to actually protect the aggregation of data and the level of information within the database. So it's uh, a, a lot to, to, to take in into consideration. Um, and Ashley, yeah, please I, chime in. You, you covered most of it uh, already in the response, and it's very weird. I just saw the question pop up, even though it's an earlier time than the other ones. Um, but yeah, there's inherent capability within some of the COTS tools to do some of that seg segregation of, from an access perspective, um, we're utilizing uh, personas, which is terminology from you know, humans in our design, to make sure that one, the users only have access to certain functions in the system, um, as well as the separation of access to what they can see as far as you know data consumption. Um, we've also carried over uh, the distribution type of uh, restrictions uh, very similar to the legacy TIDMIS applications. So distribution statements on the tech manuals that can be viewed uh, has also been configured and implemented in NDPS. 
And then the larger part, the second part of the data, the, the aggregation that Paul spoke about, um, definitely, you know, the need for uh, creating a security classification guide to, to address that uh, is is ongoing, something that's uh, being looked at from a you know, PEO MLB perspective um, this is across the board. So NPLM is not the only uh, capability that's going to have to address that as something up across the board for the log IT port portfolio. Over. Okay. Um, and I, I guess I'll, I'll fill probably two more questions before we reach a break because I have to get some of my other speakers in. Um, do you, I'm going to go down to this question. Um, are you considering uh, any of the legacy efforts for lessons learned, including Navy Products Data Initiative, SCIM, and Navy 05 Maps? So I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with, uh, with those initiatives. But if there are lessons learned from that, we would certainly, you know, welcome them. Um, I'm just not familiar with those, um, unless Paul or Noel is familiar with those. No, I'm not, I'm not familiar with either, either one of those as well. I'm not either. Okay. Um, uh, has the realignment of OpNav in four to sustainment and logistics had an impact to the way Navy PLM will provide support? For example, is there a difference in operational logistics versus sustainment, modeling and assessment, et cetera? Actually, no. I mean, it's it's really it's kind of it's kind of twofold. Um, I, I think it actually helps us because you know N4 really kind of understands um, digital transformation effort and what we're trying to do. Um, and then integrating uh, resources under under N41 kind of simplifies how we manage the the money to support um, all the applications and and provides that, that um, ability to uh, how do I say herd the cats and dogs? So um, you know, once again, being able to look across the entire log IT portfolio and and figure out what what priorities and, and how to best realign resources within the portfolio um, is, 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 is greatly simplified um, as we, as we, as we take a look at what, what really resource consolidation brings to the table under, you know, by moving from the high nines to a single N4 uh, resource sponsor. So I think it, I think it helps us, uh, helps us in the long run. To, to do that and makes our decision making more uh, um, more powerful. Okay. And the last question. Oh, I'm going to go ahead. Hold on one second. Okay. No echo. <laughs> um, is the maturity mapping of technical data for team center and windshield being synchronized between NAVC and NAVAIR? Yeah, so we're both, so from an NPLM perspective, um, we are looking at the maturity level for all of the capability between the two PLM tools um, and looking at what, what best supports the requirements going forward as well as we have some other integration tools uh, that we're looking at that will help with the, the data exchange piece. So that's all part of what we've been working on the last uh, several months with developing an NPLM roadmap um, that will help do that assessment, uh, start that assessment process for us, as well as um, developing a, an architecture as well. Uh, we better look at the architecture of how we construct these you know, two, two PLM tools and how do we uh, better connect the, you know, the data exchange piece and make it more seamless to the end user. Um, and, and that's what we're, that's what we've been looking at, um, like I said, over the last several months. Uh, definitely a work in progress. Um, I'd say we were in the storming phase, given that both of our programs started as independent efforts. And um, we've recently basically joined forces here over the last six months 
Um, but I think it's getting there definitely at the right approach uh, to make sure that we are um, servicing the larger community. Over. Okay, team. So uh, thank you guys for answering those questions. And just for uh, the questions we did not get to, we actually have a lot of questions in the uh, Q&A function that we were just unable to get to. Um, however, we will be uh, filling all of these questions to all of our subject matter experts. And what we're going to do is have all the questions and have all the answers like typed out and sent out to the entire group so that everybody has all the same information. So again, sorry for time purposes. Uh, we don't have time to get to all of the questions. However, we do want to get all the questions answered, um, but we'll, we will just be sending them out after this event. So thank you all for your patience. Thank you, speakers. And uh, we're going to take about a... Um, a 20 minute break so I can make sure we get our speakers in and come back and be on schedule. We will come back at 1300. So if you guys want to, um, you know, use the restroom, get a bite to eat, do whatever you need to do. And we will see you guys back at 1300. And that's um, uh, Eastern Standard Time. So uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard or 1300 Eastern Standard Time. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Th thanks for uh, having us. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Ashley, this is Glenn. You still online? Of course I am. Hi, Glenn. Hey, I'm on my phone. I'm just doing a quick comms check to make sure I'm I'm good to go for this afternoon. It looks like yes, it's working. Sir. <laughs> yes, sir. And is the rest of your team, do they have the information that they need? I think they do now, yes. Okay, perfect. All righty, we will see you at brief time. Thank you. Thank you much.
Well, hello, everybody. I hope you liked our little uh, timer intermission until um, you guys come back. So as you guys are all coming back, I will uh, queue up the next slides and presentations. Hello, Tam, I see you there. Well, hello, Ashley. Thank you for that great intermission video. It's very entertaining. I know, I, 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 I thought that was really entertaining. I haven't done that before, so <laughs> I think... Uh, always got to keep your day jobs fun. And I know people say, oh, it's not professional. Well, I have to work for the next 30 years. I got to make it fun. <laughs> so um, there you are. Okay. And good afternoon. Uh, welcome back. Hope you guys had an opportunity to uh, take a quick break and welcome back to the first CO3 digit, uh, uh, Industry Day event. Um, my name is Tam Nguyen and I will kick off the briefing with the digital transformation team. Um, a quick recap of the CO3 uh, vision and mission uh, is the newest directorate in NAPC, uh, which CO3 was created to um, enable a single accountable authority for NAPC cyber and engineering uh, and digital transformation. So this move brings a strategic change to how NAF see um, this business in order to meet the challenges of the changing digital environment. Um, this, you know, with CO3 providing a unity of effort uh, for NAF see cyber acquisition, digital engineering, and um, leading digital transformation now and into the future. Uh, it ensures that NAF see um, alignment with uh, Navy and national strategy to support the great power competition. And it enables um, on-time delivery of ships and submarines by delivering the right cyber engineering, digital infrastructures and tools and practices. So that's, uh, that's CO3's uh, purpose in, um, uh, in this uh, business. Next slide, please. Uh, from the top, the Chief of Naval Operation defined the Navy Navigation Plan, and he has asked that we do, that, that we connect what we do to that vision. So for NAPC, Vice Admiral Galinas has clearly articulated the NAPC uh, Campaign Plan 3.0, uh, in which he articulated the NAPC mission priorities. Um, these mission priorities are uh, purposely defined to address CNO's NAV plan and is well aligned to support CNO NAV plan in area two, three, and four. So if you look at um, what Admiral Galinas has uh, laid out for, for NAVC mission priorities, there are three mission priorities. Um, one is to uh, deliver combat power. Mission priority two is to transform our digital capability and mission priority three is to uh, build a team. Uh, so CO3 focus on mission priority two, transforming our digital capability. But I wanted to make it clear that mission priority one, two, and three are in tandem. So CO3 really enables all three of NASA's mission priorities. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, within the, the mission priority two to transform our digital capability, um, we, uh, we were asked to focus in three areas, um, uh, strengthen cybersecurity, build our digital engineering capability, and advance our business processes. So, um, you know, CO3 uh, being the, uh, the, the central point to coordinate cyber and digital transformation to deliver that capability for, uh, for NAPC. Um, we drive enterprise-wide collaboration to transform NAPC into an organization that embraces um, digital technology to accelerate um, our mission um, to, of delivering ships and submarines on time and cost. Um, we define the blueprints on how we would operate end-to-end -end as an organization, creating the um, prioritized roadmap of programs that will get us there and lead the, the governance of our transformation portfolio. We, uh, we also set the standards for uh, and, and 
drive the adherence to our business process architecture while promoting the maturity around process engineering and organizational change management. So um, we guide these strategic initiatives and programs that touch multiple business units and span multiple parts of our value change. And, and in some case, we play the leadership role. Uh, in other, we simply facilitate change. And through our efforts, we accelerate the NAPSI's transformation, um, deliver value for the enterprise and, and driving sustainable change. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, why does NAPC commit to a digital transformation? I'll tell you why. Um, NAPC has an important mission. Uh, we design, build, and de deliver ships and submarines on time and on cost for the US Navy. And we recognize that digital transformation is the key enabler that we need to improve our mission and to improve our internal business uh, workflow, giving us that advantage we need to deliver the capability to the fleet at the speed of the mission. Um, so how will we know that we are successful in our digital transformation at NAPC? Um, what are some of the metrics to measure our success? So is the organization whose mission is to design, build, and deliver ships and submarines, we want to have our digital engineering capability that would enable us to design, um, engineer, and build and sustain our ships uh, and weapon system and, and business system on an end-to-end -end digital threat so that we always know the actual condition of our ship and system and able to take informed risk uh, in support of our operations around the world. Um, we want to have secured uh, authoritative data pipelines to support our engineering activities, uh, acquisition and sustainment activities. We want uh, our ships and submarines to have the techn technological advantage over our adversaries. And the fact is the deployment process for new technologies is reliant upon software at nearly every stage. So it's critical for us to invest in um, efficient software development and deployment processes that will enable continuous delivery of capabilities. And um, we want to effectively use our data to drive our decision. Um, we want to automate, automate, automate. We want to, you know, we want on the routine processes to be automated. And of course, um, the, 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 the key enabler for all of this is developing a digital savvy workforce to keep innovating. Um, next slide, please. How, so how do we progress as an organization? Um, the bottom line is achieving um, the NAPC mission. That's our end goal to deliver combat power and, and on-time delivery of ships and combat system. Well, the, um, you know, that's the mission we focus on every day. And, and that's the, the missions that, um, that Admiral Galinas uh, asked us to uh, work on. And to deliver that mission and achieve the 10 times, you know, 10X improvement or more, we need to transform NAPSI's digital capability. Um, but, you know, there's no magic pill, right? We transform by working um, you know, to enable, by working on these four strategic focus areas you know, in the left column to um, invest in our infrastructure, that's the technologies and, and the tool piece, um, adapt our business processes uh, to take advantage of new technologies. Um, you know, kind of like what Paul had just touched on um, in the MBPS discussion, you know, we want to use technologies um, and we wanted to be very critical of the, uh, of the business process that we have set up uh, to make sure that we uh, we adapt our processes that would take advantage of these new technology. Uh, we want to manage our, da our data and train our workforce. Um, so this, this, um, this framework of uh, maturity serves as a template for, for us in NAPC, uh, for each organization in our, in, in our NAPC enterprise to uh, take a look at within our own organization and assess our maturity level and then 
take deliberate effort to move from our current state, which may be hovering between reactive and organized um, to being connected and intelligent. Um, and transformation at the enterprise level begins with, uh, at, with each of us, um, each person, each team, each organization within NAPC um, are doing that. We are deliberate in developing these four areas within our means and uh, we do our part to move the enterprise along. Next slide, please. So in its uh, simplest form, um, digital transformation is the integration of uh, those four key components, the, the people, uh, the digital skill, uh, improved processes, digital technologies, um, and data to create a, a robust new capability delivery model. Um, all four of these components are important and uh, interdependent. Um, and with data is a centerpiece, which connect all system and, and is the glue that binds the three other components um, of the digital transformation. And you hear about uh, more about data and technology later. Uh, for, and for NAFC, we uh, pursue the digital transformation um, to improve uh, our performance and uh, find new opportunities to drive innovation, uh, becoming more efficient and uh, figure out how we can harness our data to inform our decision. So, you know, all, all four of these building blocks are critical to our digital transformation journey and the initiatives that we pursue are ways to exercise and mature these four building blocks. And uh, you've heard about some of them earlier today and um, you'll hear about some more initiatives later. Um, this afternoon. Uh, next, please. So um, where do we start? Uh, I'll say we'll always start with a specific problem that if we solve, we'll make life better for our customer. Um, you know, uh, that could be the fleet, that could be, um, you know, another organization within our command, um, and it, it relieves the pain points for the customer. So. Um, we focus on allowing small teams with specific mission objectives to solve the problems that would have um, enterprise impacts and have the executive support to remove the roadblocks, allowing them to solve the problems locally um, so that we, um, we can uh, you know, scale. The approach is to solve for one and scale for many. Um, the current focus for our digital governance um, is uh, ships and submarine maintenance and shipyard availability through these six um, initial use cases. Um, these six use cases are not independent and discrete, but rather they are these are selected to support a theme of keeping ships at sea. Um, the idea here is to focus on real NAFC problems and um, finding out and highlighting. Um, efforts that that will that different organizations within NAPCs are doing um, to contribute to solving this problem. This is where everyone in NAPC, uh, across the NAPC enterprise, including our PEO, our directorates, and uh, our warfare centers can contribute. Um, for example, uh, you take digital ship check. Uh, this problem here is, um, is that availabilities are often delayed by the uncertainty of the state of the ships. Um, it caused schedule delay and cost overrun. So the bottom line is that unplanned work is a key driver in ship delay and the and our inability uh, of the ship to uh, balance the report. So ship checks have the vital role of preventing, uh, digital ship check has a vital role in preventing the rework. Um, and we want to exploit um, digital tool sets to inform and um, ready maintenance to reduce these unplanned work and make sure that we don't inadvertently miss out on things. Um, how, we, how might we use models and actual measurements to uh, efficiently and accurately plan for these work? Um, based on our knowledge of uh, digital initiatives across NAPC, we are identifying a handful of efforts that uh, might give 
uh, this use case a head start. Um, and you know, other uh, initiatives that we are working on include um, the uh, departure from specs, uh, the DFS process. This is just one of, um, of many engineering business processes that are uh, executed you know, uh, manually. And um, so we might, uh, how may we apply digital transformation using uh, digital data and improve processes along with digital technology to standardize the process, you know, enable data-driven risk assessment. Um, so this use case focuses on uh, achieving authoritative data source uh, for risk assessment and intervention. Um, our, um, our use case three for, um, would be something that we, uh, we are driving to develop and sustain um, to, you know, to drive down the number of, um, of data environments and, and um, that we are sustaining right now. It's, um, it's not, uh, it's creating a lot of uh, duplicative capabilities and it limits information sharing. So um, we would wanna look into how these platforms might um, improve collaborations and providing that uh, uh, enduring authoritative data and knowledge sources um, so that we can share our data and explore the data to its fullest. And um, uh, use case number four, uh, the uh, Etsy emergent software change. That's uh, basically how we uh, could uh, deploy, uh, how we could uh, apply the DevSecOps um, philosophy and, and uh, tool chains to deliver combat capability and system upgrade to ship at sea. Um, so that we can increase the uh, the on time uh, station, uh, the, the increase the time on station, and and reduce the need to bring the ships back. Uh, effectively, increasing uh, the ships as above. And um, and uh, let me see. Um, uh, uh, digital ship uh, system uh, design and, and training. Um, how might we use digital data and technology to better train our engineers and operators, you know, giving them better understanding, uh, understanding of the systems so that they can um, rapidly uh, deliver new capabilities. So um, it's about helping people do their job better. Um, the, the, the number one hardship for the workforce is finding the, the data. So how can we leverage the technology to, uh, to improve the, uh, the workforce proficiency and, and enable them to increase performance in on-time delivery. So, um, so I hope this has been um, informative and, um, and worthwhile for you. Um, next, you will hear from uh, Steve Carter, who will discuss the NAPC cloud program. It's, um, and it's an uh, exciting time for all of us. Back to you, Matt, um, Ashley. Um, yes. Yeah, so Sorry, yes, yeah, so we are going to actually take questions for this entire group at the very end of the presentation. So like, so we have this presentation and I'm pulling up the, um, the next two. So after, after all three of these presentations, then we'll take questions for all three. Hey, good morning and afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Carter. I'm the uh, program manager for the cloud team. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, that looks like uh, the wrong screen is sharing. Hold on one second. Stop and start. So in the interest of industry day, um, some of our partners, I, I left out many partners here. This is a sampling of some of the industry partners that uh, we have been working with to, to really get our cloud program up and running. Uh, more to come and certainly there, this is not exclusive uh, to just these industry partners, just a sampling of 
Um, next slide, please. All right, so, so what is our, our approach for, for the cloud? Um, so, you know, I stole some of these uh, in, with permission from AWS uh, of, of how we wanted to approach the NAVC cloud, right? So think uh, big, think enterprise uh, scale, start small and then scale. So, you know, when we were looking at um, how we wanted to approach the, the NAVC cloud, uh, you know, we reached out to many industry partners and best practices across DON and industry. And uh, the overwhelming uh, recommendations were, if you think big and start big, uh, you're gonna fail and have to go backwards. So that was the incremental approach that we took in developing our, our cloud program in alignment with both NASI's mission priority number two and also NASI 3s uh, priority of developing the digital architecture. So what we are have attempted to do was uh, build out a cloud solution that allows uh, the mission owners you see there on the right. So from ships, shipboards, um, business applications, uh, combat systems to leverage a secure uh, cloud architecture uh, for which their environments can run. And this is really an FY19, uh, when we first started the program, there were only two solution sets available to the Navy and our approach was to have a, a multi-cloud environment. So, you know, the only two through those buckets at the time were both AWS and Azure. So those were the uh, efforts we engaged in uh, with the um, intent of initially hosting impact level four and five to include UNNPI at the impact level five. Uh, we have received our authority to operate for both impact level four and five, and we also have gained NAVC08, that's Naval Reactor's um, authority to host uh, UNNPI at impact level five in both Azure and AWS. Uh, the caveats there with respect to UNNPI is that this goes with any system really going into the cloud that uh, our umbrella authority to operate, um, you would still have to get your own authority to operate via a memorandum for record, uh, NAVC 08's concurrence on uh, your solution set, uh, but really our, our umbrella provides a secure environment to protect your data and your users. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the non-CTI CUI version of, of, the, of the cloud program. So, um, you know, what do we do? So we took the Department of Defense Cloud Computing Security Requirements Guide, distilled that down into technology, process, programmatics, uh, and to make our environment compliant, right? So we host the VDSS and VDMS, the Virtual Data Center Security Stack, and the Virtual Data Center Managed Services uh, along with the Trusted Cloud Credential Manager, which is more of a paper process uh, type of thing and not, not necessarily a technology thing. There are some aspects that are technology um, to build a, out a secure cloud computing architecture. The fourth leg of that is the, the boundary cloud access point. So that is mandated. The Navy has not received a exception of policy like some of the industry partners might be aware that the Air Force, for instance, has a cloud native access point. The Navy right now uh, is still um, requiring that boundary cloud access point uh, to, to be part of the SCCA. We are looking at some uh, early future state discussions of how do we uh, merge our, our DREN and uh, NREN uh, infrastructures to leverage the cloud uh, without having to go back around through the boundary cloud access point to enter to enter the VDSS and VDMS, um, because right now today, uh, DRN users uh, can access the cloud through the RDT&E cloud through Navi Pack. Um, and for those of you that understand the technology, um, once you're in Amazon's data center or Azure's data center, uh, whether you got there through DRN or you got there through the BCAP, uh, guess what? You're in the same data center. So a lot of that is policy-based and not necessarily technology-based. Um, so we're investigating how can we break down those barriers of policy to securely 
extend uh, DRAN and NRAN um, and leverage the VDSS and VDMS that we have uh, positioned today. Um, in all frankness, the VDSS and VDMS are using legacy, legacy technologies um, and not cloud native tools. And, and part of that reason is really um, we knew on day zero of building this out, um, the easiest path to success was using things people were familiar with, F5s, Palo Alto, Cisco Firepowers, um, those kind of things that um, we knew could get past um, the NAO and uh, NCDOC and get us you know, the authority to operate. Um, we also took a novel approach in um, having four different enclaves. So you'll see there at the bottom of the slide, production, test, integration, development. Um, so we're the first um, that I'm aware of, Department of Navy um, cloud that has a development zone all the way through production zone. Uh, meaning, for instance, if you're an RDT and &E, uh, normally you're stuck in the uh, zone C or zone D, zone Delta uh, for doing development. Uh, we, we have all four zones. Uh, in the interest of time, next slide, please. Next slide, please, Ashley. Sorry, it's coming. <laughs> no worries. Hopefully, until my internet starts doing what it does. <laughs> there we go. Um, so some highlights from uh, the cloud program. So uh, we're the first for the Department of Navy for a few things. Uh, we're the first multi-cloud environment capable of hosting unclassified naval nuclear propulsion information, UNDI. Uh, there's been one program that has beat us, and that is through the Department of Energy. Uh, and there are several other programs out there that are hosting UNNPI, but they're not hosting it um, like, like we are. Um, so the specifics on that are really it's just system based as opposed to um, platform based. Um, and as I mentioned on the last slide, we're the first multi cloud environment that's capable of hosting production through RDT&E systems. Uh, we also took some novel approaches on how we could reduce uh, the cost to the end user. Um, so PNW 270 that has now um, been termed the um, cloud service management organization so that they recoined themselves. Uh, PNW 270 I believe stood down and the cloud service management organization pretty much same people, a little semantics, maybe some policy process there um, stood back up. but. Uh, from their website, um, you know, looking at what other Navy cloud providers uh, cost is, the cost avoidance that, that we're offering is, is four to five over uh, them. And so it's not an, a direct apples to apples comparison. So the reason why we were able to, to reduce the cost to the end user was NAVSIA, 30 Admiral Wynn, uh, Red Admiral Burn, the Warfare Centers. Uh, we at NAVSIA 3 have made cloud a priority for the NAVC enterprise. Um, so uh, we have funding through FY19 through 21. Uh, we have negotiated, I've negotiated with, with Admiral Wynn uh, for continued funding in FY22 to offset these costs to, to our end users. And I suspect as that user base uh, increases, uh, the required funding from NAVC 3 will um, incrementally go down as well. Uh, again, the idea is for the cloud to be a kind of a self-funded enterprise. And as we reach that critical mass of, of the right number of users or mission owners that are using the uh, NAVC cloud, uh, those fee for services will go further down. Uh, one of the other reasons, and I don't know if this is a long-term solution, but it's really a necessary solution today. Um, we have a, what I'll call a bring your own system integrator model or, or bring your own technical knowledge model. Um, that allows uh, my program to have uh, fewer staff um, waiting for you. So I don't have you know, the Azure SME, I don't have the AWS SME uh, sitting on a bench waiting for you, right? So I'm not also burdened with that cost of, of paying for that integrator or for that um, um, government person to, to help you out with technical integrations. So you need to bring your own technical knowledge. Uh, I think in FY22, what you're gonna see is we're gonna have contract vehicles aligned. Um, so if you don't necessarily have that 
system integrator ready to help you or that uh, subject matter expert in cloud to help you, uh, you'll be able to procure through through a, a contract line that, that we provide at NASC. But, but right now that's not our model. Um, so you really need to either have that with you or be ready to get it if you want to use the, the NASC cloud. And that allows us to, to reduce uh, cost to the end user. Next slide, please. So policy has been a, a frequent talking point about uh, things in cloud. And, and this is a, a small smattering of the policy. This isn't even all inclusive. Uh, not to mention, uh, I left this up here because uh, in the last six months, uh, this has changed fairly dramatically. Uh, NAV admin 122.21 came out. Again, that's 122 slash 21. It's publicly available. You can go type in Google NAV admin 122 slash 21. Um, that came out and can canceled the Navy cloud policy and the um, the Navy commercial brokerage cloud policy. Um, and um, one of the reasons they did that was in December of 2020, they issued the Department of Navy cloud policy. That was a joint memorandum from Don CIO and Assistant Secretary of Navy for Research Development and Acquisitions uh, that stood up the cloud SMO, the cloud service management organization, uh, recoined Navy Cloud Broker to Navy Technical Agent uh, and changed some of the policy dynamics. So as an industry partner, understanding some of these constraints, um, some of these restrictions, some of these um, stovepipes uh, really will benefit you as you uh, uh, negotiate with, with NAVC and Navy partners. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're really big on infrastructure as code um, and, and not bringing um, your legacy system into the cloud uh, to use it like a data center. That would be the wrong way to use cloud. You, you're never going to see the cost benefits by just lifting and shifting uh, a legacy application into the cloud. Um, so what a lot of uh, mission owners don't know is um, I would say uh, this is across DOD and not just DON, that there are not a wide swath of people that understand uh, cloud or how to, to do this in the cloud. They don't understand um, all the tools that are out there. Uh, and again, they're, they are plentiful um, through different vendors of, of, of different migration techniques of how to do cloud. Um, um, sorry about that. Um, so we have uh, stood up infrastructure as code. So from the time a mission owner wants to to be on board with us, as long as they send us a funding document, sign a um, privilege user access form, a SARN form, and our service level agreement, uh, it literally takes 11 minutes for us to run the Terraform script to build out either your Azure or AWS uh, environment. So it's very fast. And because you are bringing that technical expertise with you, uh, we provision your environment, and as long as you stay within your funding bounds, um, the environment is yours, uh, and also the risk is yours. So if on a weekend uh, the uh, end user spends up a thousand virtual machines, uh, as soon as I see that cost hit on Monday, I'll, I'll shut them off, right? I have to protect us from law and anti-deficiency act violations, um, but really the, the risk is at the, uh, the end user and also the reward uh, subsequently and, and speed to action. Um, next slide, please. Uh, there is tremendous demand for cloud across the NAFC enterprise. Uh, during when we could travel uh, back in 2019 and really early 2020, Tay Rolinski and I uh, traveled to, to most of these places, had phone calls with others, uh, and really gathered requirements uh, across the entire NAFC enterprise. And again, it's substantial. And one of the things we took away was uh, also, there was a, a bit of a deficiency of, of how to operate in the, the cloud environment. Uh, so I see it, that as being one of the biggest constraints to adoption uh, today, which again is why I keep on harping on the, the bring your technical knowledge. When we built the uh, NASE cloud environment, uh, we did not want to be prescriptive in its use or how to use it. 
So it's really a foundational uh, platform to um, encourage digital transformation across NAFC. Next slide, please. And again, these slides will be provided, but there's our functional mailbox. Um, so please feel free to contact us via uh, that email. Okay, thank you. I always love those things in the last slide. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna grab the next one. All right, Ashley, a quick sound check. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. Thank you. Well, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you're at. My name is Rachel Carroll. I'm NAVC's Command Data Officer Deputy. Today, I will provide you with an overview of our data management program and how it supports digital transformation for the NAVC enterprise. Next slide. So let's start with who we are. The data management team is led by the NAVC Command Data Officer or CDO, Ms. Donna Carson Jelly. As you see in this slide, NAVC CDO role aligns with the responsibilities of the Associate Data Officer role defined in the Naval Data Management Concept of Employment, which was published in August 2020. Donna and I came together in March of this year to stand up NAVC's first ever CDO and CDO deputy roles. And then we brought on two data scientists, Sarah Dooley and Lieutenant Commander Jose Sands in April to help round out our initial data management team. We know we need many more folks to do the important work of uh, data management for the enterprise, but um, this is where we're at and how we're starting. At a high level, our office manages and oversees the implementation of data management policies within NAVC Enterprise as well as assist the Department of Navy CDO and others at the Naval level with the development of data management policies. Next slide, please. Here's a series of uh, data related policies and guidance that have been published by the DOD and Navy over the past year. There's definitely a lot of buzz in this area as the importance of managing data as a critical asset is gaining traction across all of the echelons. I won't speak to each of these individually. However, um, I did wanna make you aware that these documents exist and point out that the Department of Navy has identified 12 information domains that require management. This concept is a significant change in our culture. It means that the Navy wants to manage and govern data by information domains rather than organizational units, uh, systems, programs of record, or funding lines. So uh, let's remove the stovepipes to accessing data and, um, and, and group the data in a, in a more logical fashion. To do this, each information domain has an assigned data steward who's accountable for data within their domain, regardless of the system containing the information, the organization producing or consuming the data, resource sponsor or functional sponsor. Again, breaking down the silos to data access. The key takeaway here for NAVC and our industry partners is that we must align our data management efforts with the Navy and these information domains. Next slide, please. So now that you know a bit I guess I should wait a little bit. <laughs> so now that you know a bit about who we are and how our office is aligning with the Department of Navy for data management, I'd like to share with you how we're aligning with NAVC's digital transformation strategy. In January of this year, NAVC published its campaign plan to expand the Advantage 3.0. As Tam discussed earlier, it's the strategic plan for the NAFC enterprise, and it's in alignment with the CNO's navigation plan. There are three business objectives or what we at NAFC call our mission priorities, and those are outlined in the campaign plan. Mission priority two, which is transform our digital capability is the business objective that our data office and the digital transformation group is aligned to support. And as you can see on this chart, we have two strategic objectives that are the focal point for all of our efforts. 
The first is to enhance our digital engineering capability, and the other is to advance our business processes. To achieve these objectives, we've established goals for things like enhancing our automation capabilities, predictive analytics, and other digital methodologies. But fundamentally, we must do the work to build a solid foundation for digital transformation in an organization as large as ours. To do that, we must establish a supporting infrastructure. We must provide an authoritative data source for where our data can be accessed, used, and trusted. And we must transform and empower our workforce to become digitally savvy. After all, digital transformation will only be successful if the knowledge, skills, abilities, and behaviors of our workforce are also transformed. Next slide, please. So let's drill down yet another layer to data management specifically. Digital transformation requires the integration of people, process, technology, and data. As you saw in Tam's presentation, uh, data is the central element as it is what we create, it's what we consume, and it's what we ultimately will use to make decisions in our work. Therefore, our data management mission is, is as you see here on the screen, and I'll read it out to you in case you can't see the screen. Our mission is to make NAFC enterprise data visible, accessible, understandable, linked, trustworthy, interoperable, and secure. Um, that's quite an ambitious mission, but it's critical that we do this in order for NAFC to continue to advance in its mission for the Navy. Next slide, please. And I'm trying to move quickly because I know that uh, we're getting into our Q&A time. I just have a couple more slides here. So this is a view, a um, high level view of our NAFC Enterprise Data Estate. It's our operational concept. Um, the NAFC Cloud Infrastructure is an integrated solution, as you heard from Steve, that utilizes both the Amazon Web Services GovCloud and Microsoft Azure Cloud. With respect to data, over time, we expect to integrate external authoritative data with the cloud or migrate internal authoritative data into the cloud. We'll do this initially through small scale projects or use cases that serve an organizational need with data. We will establish a data catalog in alignment with the information domains that I mentioned earlier. And the key here is that we'll learn and demonstrate capabilities at a small scale and then build out the supporting processes. We'll share our lessons learned and scale the processes for greater organizational benefit. This is what we're calling our crawl, walk, run approach to data management. Next slide, please. The next couple of slides really go into a little bit more detail of what I just said. Um, <clears throat> so I'll try to move quickly through these. In terms of our strategies and our action plan, um, we've mapped out we've mapped out what we're going to do here in FY21 and FY22. Um, initially, what we want to do is establish a one-stop shop data management concept so that we can put the right data in the hands of our decision makers at the right time. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll leverage the cloud as our foundational infrastructure, uh, initially capturing and sharing our as-is data architecture so that we can make it transparent and accessible to the right people who uh, need to access the data. We'll define and develop a standardized data catalog. We'll do this in alignment with those information domains that I spoke of. And we'll utilize Microsoft 365 as our common knowledge management tools and dashboards for our workforce. We'll employ the crawl, walk, run approach to achieve our initial operating capability. This is essentially what we're considering our first increment of a data architecture to managing data sets that exercise uh, NAFC cloud capabilities. And we'll, we'll do this using our uh, use cases as our uh, opportunity for solving our engineering or business problems that, that NAFC may have. And then we'll publish an enterprise data estate concept of employment. 
And this is where we're going to define what the enterprise data estate is, how our NAFC personnel will utilize it, how they can interface with it, um, and, and we'll address things such as our data catalog, architecture, standards, governance, all those sorts of technical details, as well as talent and culture, and our iterative problem solving approach, uh, the, the crawl, walk, one, run approach with small team use cases. Next slide, please. Um, the next thing we need to do, which we'll probably spend uh, quite a bit of this effort in FY22, is building a data architecture to serve as the framework for our authoritative data repository. We want to make NAVSI's data accessible and transparent. Um, excuse me, uh, and we want to determine our authoritative sources that need to migrate or integrate with the NAVC cloud. Uh, we also will need to determine any interface requirements for where data needs to flow, feed, or integrate with the NAVC cloud. Um, this, this is definitely an exercise in discovery, and uh, we know that we're going to need a lot of help here in learning uh, the proper way to bring in our, our systems and our teams and data in order to make the best use of the cloud. And um, last but certainly not least is that we need to lead our workforce development uh, efforts in terms of data science so that we can build knowledge, skills, and abilities, but also and ultimately behaviors that support digital transformation. We need to establish requirements for data science training program We'd like to develop a continuum of curriculum that reaches all of our employees where they're at. We recognize that everyone is a data citizen and needs to um, have some fundamental data science training related to being a data citizen. But then we also have other people within our organization that require more sophisticated training and um, more detailed or, or, or deep dive type um, development in order to really take you make use of the data um, integrating our systems and tools and capabilities in the cloud and then ultimately informing our business um, processes and decision making in a way that perhaps we've never done before we're going to conduct market research to do this. Uh, we're, we're looking to see, you know, what's out there commercially as well as within the government related to data science training. Um, and we want to leverage existing training that creates business solutions. We are not um, heavily resourced in this area right now. So it's really important that we make the best use of, you know, what's out there, get, get the most bang for the buck, so to speak. Um, and leverage what's, what's currently available. And um, to that end, we're working with NAVWAR right now. They have a data science fundamentals workshop and uh, continuum that they've developed. And we're currently pilot, piloting it um, as we speak. They have a class in session today. And um, ultimately, what we hope to get out of this particular program is that not only will our participants who, who go through the training, not only will they develop some new knowledge and skills, but they will also have the opportunity to um, apply what they've learned to a real project that adds business value in NAFC. All righty, uh, next slide, please. That is all of the content that I have for today. So I believe at this point, We'll go into Q&A. It actually looks like you guys have some star students on your team. I saw questions being answered <laughs> as, as we were going. <laughs> um, just so we have a, just a few questions. Uh, who, are, who does or will manage the RMF requirements for all of this cloud environment? No, so <clears throat> that's a good question. So um, we have uh, four use cases in our cloud package. Um, they don't, if you're familiar with the RMF use cases, so directly aligned to those, there's something we made far. So the first 
two use cases uh, follow the more memorandum for record type of process, and the last two follow more your traditional authority to operate process. Um, each of those uh, really, um, how many CCIs can, um, or does the mission owner who's coming to the cloud want to leverage from the fantasy cloud? I, I, will, I will say that the team today is not resourced well to do much with use case one or two, uh, but the intent is to eventually be able to, to, to do that. Um, the other aspect of the memorandum for record process, if you're familiar with it, is uh, unfortunately it's a sequential process. So for instance, for our Amazon package, if we have a missioner coming in, they want to become a use case two, for instance, and we start processing that memorandum for record uh, for that use case two, we are now beholden to the process and the workflows sequentially. So uh, let's say a month down the line, another mission owner wants to come and they want to be a use case one. Uh, we now have to wait for that first MFR to be processed by the NEO prior to processing the other one. So uh, the workflows right now do not work great with uh, our intentions. Uh, we're hoping that will eventually be remedied. And I'll answer Rick's other question too while I'm answering his first one. Uh, some of these speakers may be too young to answer this, but how is this effort any different from the data center consolidation that took place from 2006 to 2010. So, so great uh, question. Um, I would say that from NAVC's point of view, uh, we're really trying to take care of NAVC uh, and not do this consolidated effort that, um, you know, depending on your point of view, didn't go great with data center consolidation. Um, so we're really trying to take care of our enterprise. Um, I can't speak for the, the Navy in general, um, but we're really trying to take a holistic view of how can we make it easier to use and not confine people to, to a singular organization that's doing the consolidation. Okay, um, the next question is, have any of the CO5 early stage design tools migrated to the cloud? Uh, nothing that I'm aware of as far as the nav C cloud. Now they may, so the Navy policy that came out said that um, any Navy NC could use any other Navy entity for, for cloud resources. Um, there are discussions. I, uh, my calendar is full with, with discussions uh, on every given week. And I, I don't recall having a conversation with CO5. It's not to say I didn't, I just, I, I don't remember that particular um, use case. Okay. Uh, can you provide a resource or URL to learn more about memo memo for record RM, RMF process for that? Um, I could, I don't have a top of my head, so we'll have to get back to you later with that. Okay. Do you have access to AWS and Azure third party uh, partners via marketplace or in other contracts? Yeah, so that's an interesting question that, uh, you know, we've been trying to work through because uh, those marketplaces allow you uh, to procure, I'm sure the person answering that, or asking that question, I think it was Lisa, um, knows that uh, you can procure software licenses from their marketplace at a discount through uh, either AWS or Azure marketplace. Um, some of that gets into dip or don issues, some that gets into requirements issues, contract issues. So I'm trying to process uh, that information now and figure out what the best strategy for having mission owners use that uh, unfettered. Uh, I don't have a great answer today. Okay. Can we begin onboarding into the NASA cloud environment? And if so, where do we get started? So two answers. So the short term is uh, legacy email, which I hate. Um, our ServiceNow instantiation was tied up with the uh, AWS package. So we have it as a, we put it on a virtual machine as opposed to using ServiceNow's software as a service. Um, so the process is there where we need to get our authority to operate. Once we got our authority to operate, um, 
there were sequential dominoes that had to fall, uh, registering and snap to get our cloud permission to connect, then integrating with DISA to get the BCAP. Then once all of that is done, uh, then we'll be able to broadcast our URL for our ServiceNow, uh, which will be our entry portal. But right now it's unfortunately um, uh, the email address that I showed. Okay. Um, has NAFSI included or considered application workload automation, WLA, technologies to automate complex application workflows as part of its strategic objective number two? And uh, who would be your PSC to contact for the, the discussion on this topic? You see that, that question? You, Rachel, or, or Tam? Well, we're doing the one on one sessions tomorrow, and I think that's a good first step. Um, this looks like it's from Brian Erickson. Brian, I'm not sure what company you're with, but hopefully you'll be in one of our one-on-one -on -one sessions tomorrow. Um, this is back for Stephen Carter. What is the data protection strategy for not only the backing up of data, but the rapid time to restore to meet readiness goals? Yeah, so if you're familiar with, uh, we registered our packages as medium, medium, medium. Um, our restoration is, is fairly quick. You know, again, we're doing infrastructure as code. Uh, as far as the mission owner environment, that's completely up to the mission owner and how they want to do their backups. Uh, there are different strategies. Uh, if you have really important information that you never want to lose and you're worried about uh, an Amazon data center or region going down. Um, you know, there are industry partners that I've discussed with and, and some of them uh, actually do backups in the other cloud provider uh, to have a really like really secure resource. I mean, but uh, both AWS and Azure, you know, have five nines of availability. So uh, uh, we do our own backups for our security stack. Uh, we do differential backups uh, fairly regularly. Um, so I'm not sure if there's anything more to that question. Over. Okay, and then the last question we'll be taking before moving on to the next session is, is there any plan or process for a NAFC program to move the AWS app established under a different broker to the NAFC cloud? Yeah, so, uh, you know, part of the program and, and something that I mentioned before was uh, when we stood up the NAFC cloud program, uh, we didn't want to prescriptively uh, tell people where their applications or systems need to live. Uh, I think long-term that might make more sense to be more prescriptive, uh, but as we were getting off the ground with a minimum viable product, uh, we knew our throughput and bandwidth would be, you know, sort of restricted based on the staff and technology we had today. Uh, I think as we approach, you know, FY23, uh, maybe even late in FY22, as our processes become a little more automated, as our fee-for-services go down, as a lot of technology develops. Uh, I think it might make sense for, for NAVC to consolidate on NAVC. Um, so all our systems and applications are under one umbrella, uh, but right now there's just no prescription to do that. Okay, thank you, team. Um, so we, we had a couple of questions come in, but um, we're a little bit behind schedule. So we'll just like um, wanted to reiterate from this morning. Uh, we will be taking all these questions. I know we had to dismiss a lot of them. However, we'll take these questions and then we will put them out to the rest of the team so that we can get all of the answers typed up and sent out to the whole group. Next, we will be having the IT group. IT roll call. Is the IT group on? Are you guys on mute? Am I on mute? My check, my check. Can you hear Are us you now? Oh, yes. Ashley, can you hear us now? Yes, we. Yes, I can. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> we had some, uh, you know, the IT team is having IT issues today. If that, if you can imagine that. No, not you guys. 
<laughs> <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, can we move on to the uh, next slide? And now I'm having IT issues. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, good afternoon and uh, morning, depending on where you are, everybody. Uh, my name is Glenn Long. I am the Director for Enterprise IT Services. Um, I will be try to be respectful of uh, everybody's time and try to keep you awake and entertained, uh, if not informed, throughout this brief and the briefs that follow. Uh, starting with uh, just a quick overview of who we are, what's our mission in Enterprise IT Services, uh, you're, you're looking at our mission statement right now. It's, it's a lot of words. I'll read it to you and then I'll tell you just the Reader's Digest condensed version of what it means to, to us. Uh, Enterprise IT services drive successful on-time delivery of ships and submarines. That should sound familiar. Through the fostering of innovation, prioritization of technology initiatives, and coordination of the deployment, evaluation, and management of the current future technological systems across NAPSI Enterprise. So you've heard a lot of things today about um, the, the, the groups and the, the different things that CO3 does to support the enterprise in execution of its mission. Um, from our perspective in enterprise IT services, what we do, what we are, are the underpinnings of all of that. Um, back in my days as a, a, a sailor in the nuclear Navy, but, you know, the good part of the Navy, uh, we, we had a statement that we used a lot. Our idiom was nobody moves until we do. And that's pretty much how IT sees IT. Um, everything that everybody does is on a computer, a phone, a network, or an online system of some sort. And our job is to shepherd the delivery of those services to the enterprise and to maintain them. Uh, next slide, please. It's coming. <laughs> okay, so our group, um, I, I'm the director and uh, I have Tate Radlinski who's also online. She's my deputy and, and really the brains of the outfit. Um, we're broken into to four pieces. Uh, three pieces are kind of the operational component of the organization and then we have the emerging capabilities component which is the you know, we're going out and getting the new stuff that we can provide to the enterprise uh, to, to operate on uh, that's managed by our three branches, which is the enterprise applications group, the NMCI group, and the IT portfolio management group. So if you were to chop those into two, two pieces, the emerging capabilities piece, uh, the, the different things we're working right now today, um, are the, the transition, uh, you know, operation flank speed, right? It's the word of the day. Uh, trans transitioning the enterprise to, to a single uh, Navy provided Office 365 tenant, um, network rationalization and consolidation, um, uh, the, the transition to um, uh, IP circuits, um, you know, the iNavy transition to SharePoint Online. Now that one right there, we'll talk about that in a little more detail later. Uh, iNavy is our, is, is a huge uh, SharePoint solution that several large stakeholders across the Navy have equity in. Well, as we transition to flank speed, SharePoint Online comes with that. So uh, iNavy is, is uh, marked to be sunsetted. So right now what we are doing is NAVC is driving the effort across the Navy to transition from uh, the current uh, iNavy solution, which is based on SharePoint 2013, uh, to the SharePoint online uh, solution. Um, other efforts are uh, we are deploying uh, DREN and SDREN to the Washington Navy Yard in support of the engineering community. Um, we're looking at uh, being a key driver to records management and modernization across the Navy. We have a pretty good solution for that that we and NAFC really like, and, and you know we're we're looking at helping the Navy uh, to uh, do this the right way and to come up with something that the that the whole of the Navy can settle up on. Um, and then finally, um, modernizing the way we uh, track our portfolio, um, our IT portfolio. 
So those are the two B's, right? Those are the things we're working on right now, the big heavy lifts that lead to the things that we support, right? Those are our business and mission enablers. And they fall into three uh, principal groups, uh, three branches within the IT enterprise IT services group. Um, that's the NASC Enterprise Applications, um, Enterprise NMCI, and the IT Portfolio Management bunch. And we'll talk about those in a little more detail on the next slides. You can go ahead and move to the next slide there, Ashley, please. Okay, so Enterprise Applications. So we talked about the, the, the big heavy lift of uh, iNavy um, or our our tenant under iNavy is iNavC, which is SharePoint going to the new SharePoint online. Um, right now, uh, we support an 80,000 person enterprise on the current iNavy solution, the iNavC tenant under the iNavy solution. And uh, we're currently building a, mi a migration strategy to get us quickly from SharePoint 2013 to SharePoint Online, and that is going to involve an intermediary step of uh, moving to SharePoint 2019 in the interim. Um, that is working with the iNavy program office, PEO Digital, DISA, and others, and that right now is my single biggest heavy lift um, in that we have to do it uh, fairly quickly. Um, other things that we uh, that we work in the enterprise applications group, other systems, uh, NHMDS, which is our messaging solution. Uh, we have uh, two versions of that right now on the street. We have a class and unclass uh, messaging messaging services, uh, and we manage a lot of messages every day. Uh, roughly 500 messages a day on class and 300 plus on the, the classified side. And that is actually ticking up um, for us. Um, 32 servers that we manage uh, across our, our, our solution with maintenance patching and et cetera. And that is the one thing that we do in this branch that is 24 seven, 365. Um, it is not uncommon for a message to come down that requires us to act at three o'clock in the morning. Um, records management is uh, managed largely for us under, you know, we use our CDMS, Corporate Data Management System solution. We are big fans of our solution. Uh, just wanted to throw that out there. And we are working with the Don to arrive at a Navy wide solution. There are Several ideas on what the Navy wide solution should be, Don Tracker being principal among them. Um, uh, many of them are, and this is just Glenn's opinion, lacking in capability um, compared to other things that we've seen uh, to include CDMS. Uh, that solution supports over, over 6,000 customers right now and is split across a primary uh, a primary solution and a no foreign solution, which the nukes are very uh, are are very fond of. That is where we uh, that is the one Navy solution that is is um, approved for use of unclassified naval nuclear propulsion information. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, branch two, uh, IT portfolio management. So IT portfolio management is the kind of the single area where we manage uh, datums, Dipper Don entries, um, all of our systems in Dipper Don, all of our applications in datums, annual reviews, and um, it is the single point of compliance reporting for all of those things in the Don and in, in NAVC. Uh, our, our portfolio management group really kind of, you know, they, they shepherd, they handhold the NAVC enterprise uh, with getting their new entries into the system and maintaining compliance with those entries to ensure that all of the data elements are current and up to date. Uh, we also coordinate several efforts um, in the uh, across the uh, the command, such as enterprise software licensing, um, you know where the where the NAVC go between uh, between the, the Don ESL group, and we run the uh, 
the uh, SciTep program. My, probably my favorite thing in my entire job is that we manage the, uh, the SciTep program, which is the uh, Command Information Technology Exchange program, where we uh, get to send government people to industry for six months. Um, and uh, they, they go out there, see how the other, other half does it, and then we never see them again uh, after that. Just kidding. They, they come back and they provide lots of lessons learned about how industry does business. Uh, next slide, please. I can talk while it's loading up. Last branch, or the, the next branch is Enterprise NMCI. Okay, so that's products, right? That is uh, no surprise that, uh, you know, a, a huge part of the operational IT services we get come off of the, uh, the Navy Marine Corps intranet uh, program and the engine, the next generation enterprise network uh, contract. Um, so we have a fairly sizable um, part of the organization that manages that for the entire NAVC, um, the NAVC interest or NAVC uh, enterprise. And so that is that involves coordinating um, a whole team of ACTRs or account technical representatives. Uh, across all of the, the NAVC warfare centers, um, shipyards, uh, RMCs, and headquarters, uh, PEOs and directorates, um, coordinating the efforts of all of those individuals towards identifying, procuring, ordering, and funding the, um, uh, the services and products that come off of that contract and getting them delivered into the hands of our uh, our workforce so that they can go about doing their job. Remember, everything we do is the underpinnings of the, the all day, every day work that everybody in this organization does. Um, next slide, please. So finally, all of those things that, that we just talked about, the, the three major branches, that's the operational component of the organization. Um, we spent a fair amount of time up front talking about emerging capabilities. This is kind of a new piece of this organization, and it's really kind of like our project management arm of, uh, of enterprise IT services. So they're, they're really the group that brings things in, uh, makes sure they're good. We procure it, we engineer it, we deploy it, we test it, and we get it out into the world, and then we hand it off to... Um, one or more of the other branches within Enterprise IT Service or within um, CO3 at large so that they can become the, um, um, the, the managing group, the operational management uh, component of those different things. Um, so the Emerging Capabilities Group is the, the 2B bunch, whereas the, uh, the other ones are the, the, that become the as-is the as -is bunch, the operational piece. Um, as we talked about before, big projects we're working are the, the SharePoint transition, um, the, uh, the, the, time to, the TDM to IP project, um, flank speed, um, Don records management, modernization, bringing DREN and SDREN in, and uh, consolidating and rationalizing uh, our networks. There's still a little bit more work to be done on that last, that last one there. Um, but again, our, our big the big heavy lift, the big um, high visibility effort in our in our space right now is getting us off of INAPC and onto SharePoint online. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I'll just go ahead and get started. So the you know what what we're looking at moving forward, uh, and, I, and I think I foot stumped it to death. The um, Within the uh, enterprise uh, applications group, uh, the, the SharePoint and the records management uh, challenges, those migrations are, are, are big ticket items there. Um, with IT, within the IT portfolio and compliance space, um, it really is just getting uh, to a point where we are more, um, we have a more clean way of gathering our requirements such that we can capture them into the 
you know, the, the systems of record for uh, portfolio compliance. And then, you know, and the same really applies for the enterprise NMCI bunch. That That is just being able to get to the point from where, you know, our workforce has a requirement or a need and being able to capture that and get it into the systems uh, that the program office, that the, the, the Navy Enterprise Networks program office uses to uh, get those things on contract on our behalf and get them delivered to our workforce. So that is all I have uh, today for Enterprise IT Services. I think we have another, another brief after this before question and answer. Is uh, this your slide right here? Yes, that's the one I just briefed. Huh, I missed the cue, so sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, is this is this uh, for Ann? Is this the last one? Small business? Am I missing a slide? Am I missing? I'm gonna, I'm not Ashley, it's the 4B <laughs> section for um, HQ no. headquarters. Yeah, we should. Okay. I, was, I was trying to skip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one second, everybody. I'm sorry, let me grab that. That looks like we're using this one right here. Oh, yes, Lisa. Okay, I'm pulling it up now. Ashley, I thought I dodged the bullet. <laughs> Not off the hook that, that easily. <laughs> they want to see you, Lisa. Yes, I was trying to do the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you see the slides? Yeah. Okay. All right, good afternoon, or I don't think it still would be. It still would be good afternoon for everybody except for Steve, probably. Um, <laughs> I am Lisa Peterson, the acting director of uh, headquarters IT operations, um, pretty much um, little operations, you know, Glenn is big operations for, uh, for NAPC Enterprise. Um, I pretty much, I, I focus on operations, IT operations for just headquarters, uh, NAPC. You can go to the next slide, man. Uh, what we mainly do, um, we basically have two branches. Um, I won't read the mission statement to you. Um, we basically have two branches, which is a, a service delivery, which is a customer facing, and we have network operations, which is a, our back end. Uh, basically what we always say is, you know, we're the people that keep the lights on, but uh, our mission is more so to try to keep the end user as productive as possible. Sometimes that could be a challenge with, um, you know, some of the for, for personality, some of the things that, you know, the uh, IT that's still out here floating around that we're working on, like uh, Tam's laptop. But <laughs> um, basically, uh, our, our mission is to try to keep the to enable maximum productivity for the for the end user so they can support the warfighter. You can uh, go to the next slide, please. So. Service delivery. Um, we actually do uh, a, a lot of uh, customer-facing services. Our uh, service delivery team works with a lot with protocol. So, for example, we just did the command leadership form, even though it was at uh, the Leesburg Conference Center. It was our team that helped facilitate that. Uh, we do that, uh, facilitate a lot of secure VTCs and a lot of the big VTCs that are in the auditorium. It's uh, our team that's back in the booth facilitating that, helping the customers. Um, most of the events with protocol office, uh, if well, haven't had so many due to the pandemic, but if you know, if they're outside and someone's on a podium and they're doing that, we're behind the scenes on that. Um, what's become with uh, the pandemic uh, and telework has been moved to the forefront, the mobile device uh, facilitation and support um, has actually gotten a lot of attention lately. Um, Andy Boatwright, uh, first name is actually Joseph, but Andy Boatwright is the main POC for that. Um, we are currently working on uh, adding towards or trying to expand our contract. That's something that we would like actually all of, uh, headquarters to look into uh, to make a decision, you know, do we, you know, where do we want to go in the future? 
uh, but we currently have iPhones. Uh, we're upgrading to iPhone XRs. We generally stay uh, like two iterations behind on the, we don't have uh, cutting edge phones. Uh, the Navy likes to stay a, a little uh, behind the curve uh, for security standpoint. And also we get the XRs for free. Uh, if we wanted to get the newest, we'd have to pay a little bit more money. There'd be more money for uh, headquarters and AFC to pay. But uh, we have those. We have iPads, hotspots. Um, we still get requests for air cards every now and then, believe it or not. Uh, but we have that. We have a team that helps with that. Um, they're also, they provided training last week for uh, flank speed mobility to the ACIOs. Uh, NMCI service delivery, which works uh, very closely with Echelon 2 with uh, Glenn's team for NMCI service delivery. Uh, mainly they deal with Nest and Net and eMarketplace and all of the uh, ordering that you have that goes along with NMCI that makes that run. Um, anytime, well, anytime we, uh, we're doing a self refresh, so all of the directors have ordered uh, NMCI seats to make up for the shortfall of not getting refreshed this year um, that service delivery team is 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 very much in the mix with that uh, acio support uh, we also assist the other acio teams with uh, general or any it support that needs to be escalated for example we had to step in with um we're having a lot of issues with uh scs and co5 miss burroughs uh, who was having some problems with her email because for some reason, it got cut down from her regular uh, 100 gig to 10 gig, and we ran into some issues. But we helped the ACIO team push that to the proper channel so it could get addressed. And we have service desk support. Um, we have a service desk uh, that's open from um, 0700 to 1600. Uh, they really help with uh, loaner laptops, but generally just about any questions they have uh, that come through there or anything that needs to be escalated. Let's say a network went down upstairs and someone goes by the service desk, they help direct the customer with that as well. You can move on to the next slide. So service delivery, um, what I really am trying to focus on while I'm in this acting position, I'm trying to get uh, really want to get an IT frame, uh, ITIL framework uh, set up with the, you know, event management, incident management, uh, really working to try to push uh, utilizing ServiceNow to get our, you know, workflow and processes together, couple those with the policies that need to be uh, put in place, and really just get a standard service catalog for all the ACIOs. So now from the standard catalog, you know, they can add things that are unique to like PEO, IWS. They can add things that are unique to CO4, add things that are unique to PEO ships, but have a general framework uh, just so things are easier and we can measure them. We can measure them better, especially around um, issues that are, uh, we keep getting reoccurring issues on things that we know, such as like, you know, flank speed is a very hot button issue there, but you know, how many resources are we uh, are we utilizing to, to deal with that? How much resources are we utilizing for iPhone issues or for the setup? For example, uh, the BlackBerry UEM will be going away and uh, it'll be replaced with uh, Apple Business Manager. Should be an easier setup, but, uh, you know, previously the BlackBerry, U BlackBerry UEM was a very... It wasn't the easiest setup, I'll say that. I'm sure a lot of the um, ACIO teams would feel like it was horrible <laughs> and it took two hours if everything went well. Uh, but I really want to start measuring, you know, what, where the resources need to be applied, what can be streamlined. You can move on to the next slide. Uh, it's really one of my goals, one of my main goals. Um, so really service design and integration strategy, uh, like I said before, uh, really want to get SLAs, business processes, and policy governments and compliance, which, you know, kind of has a cyber uh, element to it. Uh, get all of us on the same playing field with uh, some, some parts of our job have uh, physical security parts of it. Some parts of our job also have, um, you know, a cyber component 
to it, you know, for like people, you know, turning on their hotspots, they shouldn't, you know, they don't have a, a hotspot furnished by us. What's the policy and make it easier for the end customer to know what the policy is. You can go to the next slide, please. So network operations, uh, our core support, uh, we have our, we actually run our own uh, voice over IP system which we have Cisco phones. Um, we have two uh, engineers here on site. Uh, that may eventually go to uh, the, this next iteration of uh, NMCI for voice over IP. However, we're a little bit more agile, um, but it's uh, up to whatever decision that our front office makes. Uh, but we have voice over IP, uh, VTC tele teleconferencing, which I said like, they support a lot of the events that we have. Uh, digital signage, if you all notice around who are here actually at the Washington Navy Yard. On prem, we have uh, digital signage that pushes out information to, uh, to the monitors in the, in the common areas. Uh, my hope is to try to work with more of an IPTV a uh, solution where we can actually link in with the shipyards. We've actually just started uh, pulling the rug back on that with CO4, especially since we're merging with PMO IT and infrastructure support, which is a lot of the back end support that most of us uh, aren't aware or people aren't aware that headquarters IT does. For example, um, you can move to the next slide. The ACAS scans, Splunk, Red Seal, um, you know, all those tools are nice, but someone has to actually support it. Someone has to actually, you know, apply STIGs, uh, be aware of that. Someone actually has to do the network hardening. My team actually does that. Um, we actually have a CCIE on staff uh, that, uh, <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, that you know a lot of that a lot of that we have a SAN in uh, our it's still called the main computer room however really that main computer room doesn't have any computers in it we've moved away from that it's really network infrastructure support uh, so we have beefed up our Cisco switches uh, you know made sure those are are no longer in the life make sure they stay relevant uh, just trying to make sure, basically, if headquarters IT or headquarters wants to take on some kind of new endeavor, uh, have some kind of new tool that we have the infrastructure in the background to support it, uh, to support uh, more robust VTC or whatever we want to do, um, and it be uh, hardened on the cyber on the cyber end. And that is, I have one more slide, but that's really about it. I thank Glenn for letting me take over his uh, office. He gets less visitors than I do. <laughs> do you have any questions? <laughs> yes. Um, question from Ms. Patterson. Is there something you need help from the industry on? Uh, maybe this was a little bit earlier in there. Peterson, sorry. <laughs> um, from the, that's fine. The, uh, the, SharePoint. Uh, <laughs> oh, Glenn says SharePoint. He's trying to hijack. I really, like I said, I really need more uh, industry. We need to put better workflows in place. Mine isn't so much engineering um, as it is processes. I, I really... That's for what I would need from. It's more, uh, you know, agile uh, data mapping things of that nature. Okay. Um, next question is: uh, Given that cameras and microphones are being issued to government staff, do you expect CO three will be relaxing camera microphone requirements for support contracts given the new hybrid work environment? Um, actually, uh, that's not so, yeah, they are, but it's, that's not so much a CO3 
relaxing as it is. Uh, actually, there's a there's a new uh, there's a new nav admin nav admin out. out on that. It's we really follow whatever the nav admin uh, follows. Uh, so the, just to tell you what we're when we're able to order um, once I, the NMCI contract gets uh, the changeover gets finalized with Lidos. Well, I, I say it is finalized, but they're uh, changing over from contractors at this point from perspective to Lidos. Um, we will be more aggressive, uh, be able to order <laughs> to support um, that. And we'll be able to, uh, one of the things we had planned on ordering before that was cut off is basically to have a guest network. Um, under which is available. I know everybody keeps getting, you know, people saying, I can see a guest NMCI network on my phone, but we can't order the service at this point. Um, so when that is available, um, that will actually allow you in specific places within uh, the NAVC campus for security reasons, you'll be actually be able to use your own hope. Well, the hope is you'll be able to use your own, uh, especially for contractors, their own laptop, uh, whatever device they want to use. And as long as you follow that nav admin and we follow that instruction for, you know, cameras, how to use your cameras, you're in a certain space for cameras. Obviously you can't use a camera and a skip. Um, so I hope that answered, that was a long, <laughs> talked about everything else. <laughs> hope that I answered that question. Well, yeah, I think, I think you answered it and it looks like you're actually more popular than Glenn because someone wants to know how to get in touch with you, Lisa. <laughs> They said, how do they get in touch with you? <laughs> so I am the original. <laughs> yeah, I am the original. Yeah, uh, it is G-L-E-N-N. -N. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I'm actually the original because way back uh, before I had kids in high school, I worked in the CI. So I'm the original Lisa.Peterson at Navy.Mill. There's like two others now, but uh, it's generally easiest to, to email me. Um, you can also call, but I'm I'm horrible <laughs> with the phone. Uh, use email at Lisa Peterson at Navy dot dot mil. Hey, thank you. And um, last question is uh, it's an infrastructure question. Are there plans to increase the ability to communicate in classified environments? We have an increasing need to communicate in that environment, but the current infrastructure doesn't seem to support it. Of course. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna drop that over to Glenn. <laughs> I thought I was gonna get out of this without questions, but no. Um. Yeah. So there, there is there, there mm -hmm. from from two perspectives. One is availability of endpoints in that we're right now there is a command effort uh, just internally to net to the to the C enterprise to assess our uh, classified footprint. Where does it make sense to have it? Where does it make sense to sunset it? And where does it make sense to move it from one point to another? Fairly big uh, effort, and it's a coordination between CO3 and uh, COOP, which is the security bunch, right? Because they're the building and we're the geek stuff on the inside of the building. Um, with respect to uh, throughput, which I think is what the gist of the question is, um, yeah, the Navy is looking at that across all of its systems to include classified systems. Uh, as we transition to flank speed and other things, one of the big things there is, what do we get to shut off as a result? Um, in terms of pipes, in terms of systems, um, and, and there's a couple of effects there, right? There's less trons on the pipe clogging things up, number one. And there are less systems uh, that are out there in use that we're paying for. So that, you know, that the, the fun on the funding side of it, at least the, the way into and six puts it to us, they're looking at sunsetting all these systems and then re-wickering those funds across the fit up, you know, from now to five years from now um, to leverage against um, bigger pipes faster systems, more modern, uh, more modern IT. I, I know that's kind of a, a roundabout way of getting at an answer, the, and, but the answer is yes. 
Okay, Glenn and Lisa, looks like you guys are off the hook. And now Ann's on the hook. Thank you, guys. Oh, good job. <laughs> <laughs> Anne, are you there? I read this Anne before. Oh, and Kim. Oh, Kim's presenting. Kim? Hi, Ashley. I'm here, but Kim is the presenter. Are you on, Kim? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, Kim. Hi, so I will, in the essence of time, I will go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kimberly Ballone, the Deputy Director of Small Business Programs at the Naval Sea Systems Command at the Washington Navy Yard. I want to start off by thanking the CO3 team for inviting me to speak today. Next slide, please. I only have a few slides to allow time for questions at the end, but for today's agenda, I did want to talk a little about the role of the NAVC Small Business Office, what we do, and how we engage with the small businesses who are interested in entering the NAVC marketplace. Next slide, please. Before I go into who we are as a small business office, I'll talk a little bit about the alignment of our office. As you can see at the top of this slide, NASD Small Business Office, otherwise known as COOK, is aligned under the NASD Commander. A lot of the small businesses that we speak with often think that the NASD Small Business Office is a part of the Small Business Administration, and that is not true. COOK aligns directly under the NAFC Commander, Vice Admiral Galinas. The mission of the Small Business Office is to maximize small business opportunities in NAFC and the PEOs to support NAFC's mission of designing, delivering, and maintaining the U.S. Navy ships and systems on time and on cost. The mission of the NAFC Small Business Office is in complete alignment with NAFC's mission. Our primary responsibility as a NAVC staff code is to ensure NAVC is in full compliance with the Small Business Act and other public laws, regulations, and executive orders covering the small business program. We are also responsible for advising the PEOs and directorates on how to include small business concerns in their acquisitions to the maximum extent practicable both as prime and subcontractors. Subcontracting often provides the gateway to future prime opportunities. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ashley. This is a snapshot of the NAVC small business team at the Washington Navy Yard. We are small, but we are mighty. Each member brings wealth of knowledge from their background as small business advocates. We are led by Ms. Ann Bannister, our director, who worked for small business and private industry in the past, so she can definitely relate to a lot of the challenges that small businesses endure as they navigate through the federal procurement system. Next slide, please. In addition to the small business team at the Navy Yard, our 21 field activities each has a small business office headed up by designated small business professionals, by a, small, a designated small business professional. Each of our field activities manage different portfolios, so it's very important for you to become familiar not only with NAVC headquarters, but also our field activities. In my backup slide, I list the names and contact information for each of these offices. So please reach out to them to learn more about our field activities and the procurement that occur, occur at these sites as well. Next slide, please, Ashley. So what we do as small business professionals, 
One thing we're not responsible for is awarding small business contracts. I've met a few companies who thought that was a role of the small business office. What we are responsible for is engaging with both our internal and external partners to identify small businesses to help meet the mission. We provide tools and resources to help our requirement holders make informed decisions on small business participation, and we advocate within our PEOs and directorates for maximizing opportunities for small businesses in their procurement. We provide guidance to both the requirement holders and contracting competency on market research and acquisition and procurement planning. We also assist in the RFP structure. We review subcontracting plans and we also assist with negotiating small business subcontracting goals. We provide guidance to small businesses on how to do business with NASB and I'll talk more about that later on. And last, we engage in active dialogue with small business with the small business community on a regular basis through industry days, outreach events, and virtual office visits. So basically, in a nutshell, the small business program is a key part of the entire acquisition cycle. Next slide, please. Why do we do what we do as small business advocates? Because the Navy recognizes the importance of our small business partners. We need your innovation, your adaptability, your agility, and we need your resilience to help solve the Navy's toughest challenges. That's why CO3 is hosting this two-day event, because we all know that small businesses are a major pillar in enhancing the industrial base. So we need to connect with you. Secretary Gert, currently performing the duties of the Undersecretary of the Navy, is also a very vocal advocate for small business. And I quote, small businesses are a critical team member and a key catalyst to accelerate innovation. Therefore, utilizing small business capabilities should be a primary choice. And as a small business advocate for NASB, the Small Business Office is here to help you help us. Next slide, please. This chart gives you an overview of what we buy at NASB and our fiscal year 20 top five areas for small business execution. Number one is engineering services, followed closely by shipbuilding and repair. In third is search, detection, navigation, guidance, and instrument manufacturing. Fourth, boat building, which is small boats such as tugs. And last, electronic computer manufacturing. Again, as I said earlier, the portfolio at field activities are a little different. So you should most definitely connect with the small business teams at our field activities as well. Next slide, please. So a quick snapshot of our summary of fiscal year 20 small business spend for the NASB enterprise. In fiscal year 20, NASB obligated over 3.8 billion in small business prime obligations. In fiscal year 19, our SB spend was a little over 3.3 billion. So I'm pleased that NASB has shown a uptick in our small business obligations over the past two years. Additionally, as far as what we've procured during fiscal year 20, our number one spend category at NASB was security and protection, where we spent over 26 billion. Our second spend category during fiscal year 20 was IT, where 6.9 billion was spent, followed by 4.8 billion in professional services. This slide also demonstrates that we were also successful in meeting all of our fiscal year 20 socioeconomic performance goals. And we did this not because we went out searching specifically for hub zone or woman owned small business. We did this because we searched for small businesses that could help us meet our mission. And in doing so, 
We also found some great small businesses that fell under the socioeconomic categories. Again, while meeting goals are important to us, meeting mission is always first and foremost. Next slide, please. We've outlined the steps you as a small business need to take to become procurement ready to do business with NAVC. Step one is identify your business to include your socioeconomic category, NACE code, and product service code. SB, the Small Business Administration and PTAX are excellent resources to help you to determine this information if you're not sure how to do so. Step two is register your business with System for Award Management, otherwise known as SAM, and SBA's Dynamic Small Business Search. I would also like to point out that it's good to have your tax identification number, TIN, and Dun and Bradstreet number handy as you get ready to go through this registration process. Step three is to do your research to include who, where, why, and how. We've listed lots of research tools for you to, for your use to include NAPSI's website, and within our NAPSI web, website, you'll be able to view the long-range long acquisition forecast. Uh, we've also posted past industry day briefings, so um, very good research tools for, for you to utilize. Step four, is twofold. Market yourself and then target your market. So there's a handy dandy right there in one slide. Next slide, please. So the next step is to reach out to our small business team and introduce yourself and your firm. One thing the COVID environment ha has allowed is for us to conduct meetings virtually. We conduct 30-minute capability briefs with small businesses every Thursday. If you would like to meet with a small business team, send an email to the email address listed here, and we will get you on our schedule for a virtual meeting. We really enjoy holding these meetings because we don't know that you are out there if you don't let us know that you are out there. These meetings provide us an opportunity to start building a relationship with you so we can better help you maneuver through the NAVC marketplace. Next slide, please. And this is the list that I mentioned earlier of the NAVC small business professionals across our 21 field activities. Please don't hesitate to reach out to either myself or anyone on this list with your small business questions. And the final slide, please. Thank you for your time, and I'll open the floor for a few questions. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so it looks like I don't have any questions yet. Um, if we, okay. we can just wait like a you know like a minute or so to see if anybody has any questions for office of small business. Well, not office of small business, but the small business group at NFC. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Could be the time of day. Yes, or you just had an amazing presentation and. Uh, I don't have questions. Well organized event. Thank you to everyone well, for presenting, enjoying the content. <laughs> thank you very much. It was definitely a team effort. Okay, well, yeah. um, I, I think um, so. I know a lot of people asked about slides, a lot of people asked about their questions. If you guys don't have, uh-oh, uh-oh, two people got to the point where, um, so someone asked, are there any CO3 acquisitions for small businesses coming up? 
I would um, redirect you. Um, I would encourage you to take a, those type, that type of information um, will be posted within our long range acquisition forecast. And then, you know, additionally, as we find information out, we'll make people aware. Okay, thank you. Bring them on, guys. Bring in the questions. We got your, we got the subject matter experts here. Um, another question is, what is the best group to introduce emerging technologies to? Ooh, good one. So, Ashley, can you repeat the question, please? Which is the best group to introduce emerging technologies to? So, again, I would encourage you to um, start off and um, engage our small business office with a capability briefing and you know and then we can direct you at that point because that's going to be dependent um upon you know the technology and whatnot it, it could be that it's something that um where we have you interface with the navc small business innovation and research office Okay, when will the next long range acquisition forecast update be made? It's, it's my understanding and Ms. Bannister, please jump in if I misspeak. Um, but um, it's my understanding that this information is updated at least on a biannual basis. Um, we are looking at hosting a Small bit, our annual Small Business Industry Day this October 6th and 7th, and we're looking at doing that virtual. So one of the steps within our process actually is ensuring that the long range acquisition forecast is updated. So um, probably right before our October event may, may be the next update. Okay, um, someone asked, will the list of attendees be posted or sent out? Oh my goodness, everybody wants to know who's on the call so they can talk to each other. <laughs> I'll just say, I'll defer that one to you, Ashley. <laughs> uh, Tam, Tam, are you still on? <laughs> of course, I'm still here. Um, mm -hmm. I'm so the question is, are we, do we share the list of participants? Uh, I'm, I don't think so. Uh, that is uh, private information. So we do not, um, I, I do know that, you know, Ace Industry, you guys probably share that list, uh, but we do not. Thank you. Someone says, why do small business goals not meet SBA levels? Uh, for example, SDVO, SB at 3%. Um, the, the small business goals are based on um, research that our office conducts. You know, so it, it's dependent on a number of factors um, to, include, to include historical data as well as um, you know expectations of the type of industries in which the, the types of skill sets that we'll be looking for. Hey Kim, I'll jump in and, and Kim, you did an excellent job. I've been trying Thank to say you. You, you did you did really No, good. I was really like good. waiting for you to jump in. Please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to say that our our, our numbers at NAVC roll up into the Department of Navy higher um, goaling numbers and those percentages are recorded at that level. Over. Thank you, Ms. Bannister. Okay, so looks like we have um, Oh, so this is definitely a good one. So I, I think we are going to send out the slides. Um, we're also going to get 
the recording posted somewhere so that people can view this after. I know that some of them was a lot of small, small, tiny um, print and everything like that. Um, but thank you all for joining us today for, for the National 3 Industry Day. Um, this, this was recorded and we will be getting um, all the questions answered. I know we did not get a lot to them. Uh, we apologize for time constraints. We, we needed to make sure we got you guys the content that you needed so that um, you, when you get the questions, we can have them answered by our staff and then we can send them out to the entire group. Um, Tim, if you want to uh, tell them any extra instructions for tomorrow, I know that we were not able to get to all of the one-on-one -on -one sessions. However, I do know that no contracts or anything will be awarded for tomorrow. It's just, you know, just trying to get some information of more of the technologies out there. So Tim, if you have any remarks for tomorrow. No, um, you're correct as uh, we uh, don't have any contract award uh, at this time. Um, so for tomorrow, you all should have received um, uh, the invite with the link to join. Uh, so unlike today, I noticed that when you join, you only show um, uh, you know, your name. Uh, for tomorrow during the one-on-one -on -one session, we need to know which company you're with. So please make sure you sign in with, um, with your company name so that we can get you into your session, uh, into the, um, the, the room appropriate for your one-on-one um, -on -one session. We have uh, four breakout rooms for four different um, group in our, in our directorate. So, um, and we have a lot of uh, people with very tight agenda. Um, so please help us help you. Uh, um, yeah, so yeah, just, just to reiterate guys, the government has a lot of money for you all. So as you saw the last presentation, we have lots of money. So tomorrow there's no money being awarded, no contracts being awarded. However, you know, we just wanted to get some information from some different companies, but that does not mean if you did not get a session, you're not, you don't qualify. That, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, everybody has a fair um, shot at, at any of the awards or contracts that will be coming out. But tomorrow is just information sessions only, no money being awarded. Um, uh, questions will be answered after this and sent out along with the recording. It takes a little bit to buffer, um, but uh, be on the lookout for that information. And we thank you guys for joining us. Uh, thank you, panelists and speakers. You guys were amazing as usual. As uh, the person organizing the backgrounds and the puppet strings, you all were fantastic. Uh, so thank you all industry. Thank you all government peeps. Um, this has been great. Thank you, Ashley. Okay. And thank you everybody for attending. We'll see, thank you, uh, Ashley. We'll see some of you tomorrow. <laughs>